Tafalter Oats, Glare, the Changan, Olia Talavita, Nutali Talavita, Blean Fair 2021. Welcome, everybody, to the Irish Agricultural Science Teachers Annual Conference, but Zoom this time, unfortunately, due to the COVID pandemic. Um, I'd like to thank my executive team who organized all the speakers today, including Jack. Kennedy, who was with us in 2010 down in Moor Park in Fermoy, his colleagues Adam uh, Woods in Brennan and Dr. Siobhan Whelan from the Farmers Journal, who've all engaged with us to produce the study guides weekly with Agri Weir. And to Dr. Philip Murphy, Dr. Catherine Keane, and Dr. Stephen Whelan of the presenting the second presentation, and to Shane McAuliffe. Uh, here from the Kingdom, who will be presenting the first presentation just after myself. Um, again, we have the new spec in operation, is something that I asked to have campaigned for for years, and I uh, should have introduced myself, George Dennis, Chairman of IASTA, and um, we have it, but I'm thinking this morning, you know, when Ford brought out the Ford Cantina, after about five years, they had it revamped, made it Mark II, then a Mark three and then a Mark four, and like that, all specifications need the same degree of um, examination, re-examination, and recalibrating to get the script correct. Obviously, there's going to be problems. There are problems. We identify those in Tullamore, and we need to get the minister now to, while well, she's been very helpful, Miss Norma Foley, we would get her to get her, her staff uh, in the different agencies to be more proactive and more engaging with IASTA so that we get a, a program and a, a specification that's fit for purpose and meets the needs of our students and their aspirations and their future careers. I'd like to thank all our members for their, um, you know, vo the voluntary sharing of resources on WhatsApp groups has been fantastic over the, the past year and unbelievable stuff research, all for free, all voluntary and all shared. We know 540 members in IASTA, which is a fantastic achievement. There were times when we had a conference when we thought we were doing great at 44 or 50 or 60 or 70, even with membership of 120, we are now at 540. Again, I'd like to, to thank the agri-industry who supports us along the way and our sponsors today, um, They've been mentioned on screen and they'll be, uh, pro be doing promotion during the day. Likewise, a uh, good bit of news last night, um, Irish, Angus produ Irish Angus producers and through their CEO, Charles Smith, has again sponsored two Angus hampers. So there'll be a draw for those uh, for everybody that's attending. Um, finally, uh, I suppose would like to welcome our, our guests who will tune in at some stage today. They may include uh, Charles Smith, as I mentioned, and the Angus Producer Group, John Moriarty in Moor Park, who is involved with myself in the Nefriti project, a project that encourages young farmers and young students like that you were teaching who may engage in farming as a career or even a shared partnership. It's a youth funded program. To Dr. Dermot Rowan, who is a link with UCD and former. Um, ASA member and president, but also honorary president of IASTA. Welcome, Dermot. I'd like you to convey our thanks to your colleagues in UCD for their excellent assistance with us in producing the experiments uh, video for our teachers and our students. Likewise, I would like to welcome Dr. Owen Brennan, OBE, who is our current honorary president of IASTA. He has about two hours left as president. We know there's unfinished business and we look forward to visiting doubt at some stage when this pandemic is cleared and everybody is vaccinated. Thanks to Owen and his colleagues in Devonish. And lastly, uh, Dr. Anne-Marie Brennan, who is the pre current president of the ESE and also the, the senior agri-manager of Ulster Bank, who will be our honorary president for 2021. And I would also like to say that when, when we go back to our links with ESA and our former founding chairman, Marty Barrett, he was the instrumental in setting up the link with ESA and IASTA. Now, without further ado, I'll 
moved straight down the road from Tralee to Castle Island. And I know I follow Shane McAuliffe from time on Twitter, but he has really brought a buzz to pig farming. And I would have met his father in um, uh, Truly Irish and so on at, at um, National Plowing Association events over the years. So I'm meeting Shane on screen today. So I'll hand you over out further ado to Shane. And thank you for giving your time and your, uh, your energy and your advice to uh, us agricultural science teachers. Over to you, Shane. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, George, for the, the lovely introduction. Um, I'll just share, I can't share my screen just yet. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. So I don't know, is that something on your end? Um, I'll look at that for you now, Shane. Give me two okay. seconds. No problem. Um, just while we're waiting there, Shane, um, I will probably be asking you questions, you know, I will encourage people to put questions into the, the question and answer box there, okay. the Q&A box, and maybe at the end um, that I'll put them to you, or if we don't have time, maybe, you know, there's, if we're running out of time, we will, you, you might answer the question, stay five or ten. Yeah, of course. Presentation. Yeah. Be great. And I'll give you um, a heads up when there's five minutes left, is that all right? Perfect. That's great. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Jim. Oh, I'm now the host, so that should work for me. Now, can you see my slides? Yeah, we can. Okay, excellent. So uh, that, that's great. So we'll get started. Um, I'm going to talk um, about the pig farm here and, and give you all a, a virtual pig farm tour. Um, I must apologize because my laptop broke last week. and I lost all my presentations and lectures and videos and everything. So I kind of put something together quickly. And I, I know as I go through it, I'll probably realize I forgot some important stuff. But anyway, um, we're here in, in County Kerry, as, as George said, um, Castle Island. Um, we have 2,000 sows across four different units. Um, we are farmers and shareholders of the Truly Irish brand. And we're also farming uh, beef as well. Um, also some forestry, you can see some forestry there in the photo behind me. Um, also tillage uh, in County Offaly as well in, in Shinron. Um, my educational background, I have a master's in uh, pig health from the Royal Veterinary College. So my background is very much in pig health and pig welfare. Um, I've been working part-time off-farm for a number of years. I worked with Interchem as their pig technical manager for a few years, then I was working for Easy Fix as their international um, swine business manager. And mo most recently, I'm about to join um, an animal health company on a part-time basis that sells natural alternatives to antibiotics. So I'm always kept busy. Um, other industry roles then, I'm, I'm chairman of pig health and welfare with the IFA on the, the, the IFA's National Pigs Committee and also secretary of the Irish Pig Health Society. Um, so for this tour, I'm gonna to talk about this farm here, which is Parna Gear Pig Breeders. It's a 1,000 saw unit. It was built in 2009 on a greenfield site. We're producing about 25,000 pigs a year here. And it's a high health farm. We do not have some of the common pig diseases that you'd find on other farms, which would be mycoplasma pneumonia, APP, and, and PRRS. Um, we have about seven staff here, um, and also our, our home milling operation is based here as well. So we're milling feed for this farm and for our other farms. Um, there's an older video on YouTube. If you want to have a look at it, it just look up Partly Gear Pig Readers, and it's a, a tour that my father takes you on. Um, I, I keep meaning to, to update that and do my own video, but you know maybe this year if we have time. 
Um, so I'm going to start with biosecurity because that is very, very important in pig production. And biosecurity refers to any practical measures that prevents infection entering a pig farm or within or spreading within a pig farm. And it's a detailed plan, plan program that's part of your herd health plan and it needs to be implemented because healthy pigs are more productive, they have improved welfare, improved efficiency and improved productivity. So while you might think that carrying out these practical measures is cost, it's actually a cost effective because uh, it will pay you back. Um, like I said, improved health status, you'll have lower antimicrobial use, lower treatment costs for sick animals, lower antimicrobial resistance, and of course, higher productivity. But biosecurity doesn't start here on the farm, it starts at our borders, and national biosecurity is just as important. On the left, I have a photo there from Cork Airport, which is in Lithuanian, about um, bringing pig meat into the country, which you cannot do in your luggage. Um, and on the right is a picture of my shoes being disinfected by the Department of Agriculture in Dublin Airport um, after being on a farm in Italy with Ogeski's disease, which has been eradicated in Ireland. So, you know, like everyone, if you've been on a farm abroad, you have to declare that to the, to the Department of Agriculture on arrival at the ports of entry in Ireland. And if they deem you a risk, they, they carry out measures like that. So getting back to the farm then, site security uh, is number one. Um, you have a perimeter fence to exclude wildlife. Of course, not very important here in Ireland because we don't have the likes of wild boar. Um, also have notices at the gate with the phone numbers of our managers. Uh, we don't allow in casual visitors. It has to be um, pre-booked. We limit deliveries as much as possible. So all our deliveries by courier will go to our main office and then we collect them and take it to the farms ourselves. And then the carcass disposal bin is actually kept outside the farm. So unfortunately with livestock, you'll always have dead stock. Uh, and for the carcass skip, we keep that outside the farm so that the carcass truck doesn't have to come here um, within the farm boundary. We have our own transport company, McCall of Trucking, which means that we have our own vehicle cleaning logs and we have total control of um, the disinfection and the washing of our own vehicles. So they're used for you know, taking pigs to the factory, um, bringing feed in from, uh, from outside, uh, bagged feed, bulk feed, et cetera, and also drawing slurry to other farms. So it gives us a greater control of, of what is coming into the site. Getting closer into the farm then, we have numerous signs and disinfection points about, um, about biosecurity. There's a foot dip right outside the door that you have to dip your feet into. And then you come into the hallway. Um, this is where you sign in. With, on the visitor's book stating that you're free for 72 hours from other pigs. International visitors have extra precautions depending on, on the disease status of pigs in your country and whether you've been in contact with pigs abroad, which is important if we have consultants coming here or other farm visitors. Um, also, if you have a phone or a camera, we would have disinfectant wipes. And as you can see there in that photo, now we have a thermometer uh, just to ensure that you don't have a temperature for coming onto the farm. You have to shower in and you have to shower out again. And this is for all visitors and for staff as well. And you have to pay particular attention to your hair. And we have a waterproof primer on the side of the shower. So you press that button and you go into the shower and when you beep, it's time for you to, to go back out again. Um, where you've come from is the dirty area. So you leave all your own clothes, your own boots, uh, your shoes, everything on that side. And then on the other side is the clean area where we will give you um, the farm clothes and footwear. I'm up here now in the viewing area, which is a space where we bring visitors that don't want to go down to see the pigs. So we have CCTV in all the houses. So we have the, the computer here beside me where we can look at on the big screen and look at any of the pig houses. Um, and also we have the viewing area here behind me, which is it's looking down onto the dry sow house. Um, so I'll just lift up my laptop and show you. So this is the dry sow house. We have the service area down here where the sows are served. And then further back is the dry sow house, which the, the sows are kept um, for the duration of their pregnancy. Um, if you want to come up here, you still have to be pig free and we will give you disposable uh, overalls and disposable um, coveralls to put on your, on your feet. Um, we have a closed herd, um, as with all commercial pig farms in Ireland, um, artificial insemination is used. Um, because you know you have a substantially lower risk of disease transmission um, and also on our bee farms this is this something that we do we, we, we don't buy or sell animals in the market we have a, a very much a closed herd 
Um, so internal biosecurity refers to biosecurity, biosecurity practice within the farm. And the, the houses here are all subdivided. So in the first one here where I am, that's the dry sow house. Next, you have the farrowing house. After that, you have the wiener house. And then the last two sheds there at the bottom of that photo are the uh, fattener houses. You can also see the, the feed mill there as well at the bottom. So all in all out means that pigs of the same age of the same batch are going into one room together and they're moving out of that one room altogether as well. So this is just a layout of, of the farm map. So the dry sows are in the loose sow area and they move across to the farrowing rooms where they're giving birth and then they move back to the dry sow house. The piglets that were um, born that week, they all go out the other door of the farrowing house uh, to the wiener house. And then after there, uh, after eight weeks, they go to the fattener house. So there's no movement back of any batches of pigs. So from a biosecurity point of view, it's, it's very, very useful to limit disease transmission, but also from a management perspective, it makes your work very easy. So the dry sow, ho the dry sow house behind me is where the pregnant sows are. They're a group housed in, in groups of 100 or more because what we find is that um, in, in large groups, they fail to recognize one another because sows can get very dominant and you have your, your dominant sows and your subordinate sows. And in the large groups, we find that they actually fail to recognize each other and which sow in front of them is actually uh, the dominant sow or a subordinate. Um, now, they also have RFID chips in their ears and this gives us individual data, such as their age, when they were served, when they're due to farrow, um, how many litters they've had, and all their production figures. Um, we feed them with electronic sow feeders, and this facilitates the ease of management. Um, so this is what they are, ESFs, and it allows individual feeding of sows. So the computer reads the RFID chip in the sow's ear, and it means she gets the correct feed quantity uh, that she needs for that point during the day. Um, so perhaps if she's had too much feed already, she is, she's let into the ele electronic cell feeder, but it's not going to drop any feed down to her. So it automatically opens back up again and she's back out into her group. It's also eliminating any competition for feed, which you would have in a, in a long uh, feed truck where they would be um, you know, competing against each other for feed space. Um, if cells are in heat or if they require a vaccination, there's another door which leads them out into the passageway. So the computer will recognize this and then leave them out there uh, for the staff. So again, it makes it very easier from a management point of view. Next step, of course, is to the farrowing house about a week before they're due to farrow. Hygiene, again, very, very important here because um, of, of the piglets. Handling of piglets needs to be minimized for health and, and welfare reasons. Um, at birth, you know, as you know, that they, they do not have sufficient iron reserves, so they're given um, an iron injection um, within the first day of life and also any husbandry procedures as well. Um, this is a photo of a conventional firing crate, um, which, as we know, is there to protect pig welfare. But there's been a lot of talk in the last few years about sow welfare and what farrowing crates mean for the sow. So on our 550 sow unit a number of years ago, we built a new farrowing house. And this is what we designed with a German um, engineering company. Um, it's called Freedom Farrowing, and it means that the sow is able to move around freely 360 degrees. Now, it, it opens up and closes. So what we found is that in the first few days of life, you have the highest risk of crushing. Uh, so she's kept closed then, and then it's opened out and she's able to move around. Um, it's a really, really good system. Um, really, really good pluses for sow welfare, but it's very expensive. You can see in that photo where we're standing that it is much larger. So that also means that it, it's an additional cost. And unfortunately, we're not getting any higher premium for pigs out of this system than we would with a conventional system. So what are the benefits? Uh, the sow can, can perform pre-farrowing and, and maternal behavior that she wouldn't be able to do in a conventional farrowing crate. It encourages sow and piglet interaction. The sow is much happier, so she's actually producing more milk. The piglets have better access to her teeth. And a combination of those two means that we're actually getting higher weaning weights out of that system. 
So while we have slightly higher mortality in this system, we're actually getting better um, growth rates from these pigs. And also we found that they're showing less damaging behavior because we're doing a lot of trial work on rearing pigs with intact tails. And, and tail biting is a serious welfare problem that you can have. And we've seen that pigs from that system actually have a lower risk of tail biting. Um, vaccination happens. Um, as I mentioned, we're high health, um, so we're only vaccinating for the PCV2 virus in the pigs. And something that's used a lot in pig production is intradermal vaccines. And again, no risk of pathogens here because we're not using any needles or syringes. It's all done intradermally and it's done through the skin. Um, it's all hooked up to Bluetooth, so afterwards you can download a vaccination report of the batch of pigs that you vaccinated and how long it took you to do them. Um, because on the left-hand side is a, 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 the idle gun from MSD. On the right-hand side is the hypodermic gun from Hipra. Um, and again, we will see a lot of these come out in paper production in the next couple of years. And I certainly think it's the way forward for, um, for cattle as well, because it has so much benefits. And it's also, from a management perspective, it's much easier. So you'll also have disinfection between the sections. Either we'll have separate foot baths, like the photo there outside the farrowing house, that you dip your feet into before you go into the into the that room of pigs, or or, or else we'll have separate batches, separate footwear, sorry, where you'll change into. Um, also, there um, we have the boot cleaner because unfortunately, if you've uh, mucky boots and stick them into um, a disinfection foot bath that's not going to do anything because they have to be clean. So you need to clean the boots first and then dip them into the foot bath. Um, washing, of course, is very important. And this happens with every batch of pigs. So each room is pre-soaked with our, um, our sprinkler system. Then it's washed, it's dried, then it's disinfected, and then it's dried again. So it's a three-day process after pigs leave the, the house before the next batch comes in. Um, like, for example, we wean on a Monday. Um, so yesterday that was pre-soaking. Today that'll be washed. It'll be left to dry tomorrow. It'll disinfect on Friday and it'll be ready for pigs again next Monday when, when, we're, when we're moving pigs then from the wiener house um, after four weeks of age. Um, they're carried through this um, weighing scales because we weigh each batch of pigs for uh, for, for data or if we're doing any, any research trials and they move to the wiener house. And weaning stress is very important because um, we have to minimize it because it's a very stressful time for the piglets and they're separated from the sow, their diet is changing and we really need to help them ensure that they've really good gut health to get over this challenge and to prevent uh, post weaning diarrhea. We bring all the families together so there's no mixing of pigs. And again, this helps to minimize aggression. Um, enrichment also very important to the wean in the wiener house. Um, it's when damaging behaviors can, can start because they get stressed. So we use enrichment like that to, to keep them occupied. And it also helps limit any damaging behaviors. After eight weeks, they move from the wiener house to the finisher house. And this is a typical finisher pen where they're kept in groups of 15. And we keep them there for about 12 weeks before they leave the farm. Each section has hospital facilities, so the wiener section and the finisher section, and these are isolation rooms where we have much stricter biosecurity and they're visited at the end of the working round. So in the morning, for example, the, the guy who's in charge of the wiener section, he goes through the, all the wiener houses by age, doing the rounds, checking that everything is okay, and then at the end he'll visit the hospital rooms to check that the pigs there are okay. Um, one thing I always say is that it's a hospital and not a hospice. Um, no pigs should return to the group that they've, they've come in. They need to be there to be treated and to, to recover. Um, after that, when they leave the farm, slaughterhouse data is also very important. We have five primary processes in Ireland who are slaughtering about 80,000 pigs a week. Line speeds are very quick, about 400 pigs an hour. Um, pigs, pigs arrive in batches of about 200. Um, on, a, uh, on a trailer and you have four to five temporary veterinary inspectors doing the post-mortem inspections. And it's also very important for us to have our herd veterinarians there because it gives you a valuable insight into anything that's going on at the farm. Like for my masters, I was looking at lung legions. So I was on the lines looking at, you know, looking at the pig's lungs and hearts, looking for different 
regions and pericarditis and so on. And this you can take back directly to the farm and improve management uh, structure to have healthier pigs. I wanted also to mention precision livestock and ag tech because this is something important that we do a lot of. Um, very important to manage and monitor performance and benchmark our figures. Mobile recording is kept in retail, real time data through the use of sensors, robots, RFIDs, like I mentioned, and, and data analytics. And a combination of these help us meet ongoing challenges in health and welfare. The photo on the right, uh, the top right, is a photo of a 3D weighing scales. So it's a 3D camera that continually looks at each of the individual pigs in that pen on a continuous real-time basis and gives accurate weight figures. Um, the photo there on the bottom right is the SOMO cough monitor, which we're doing in a trial called um, PLF pig carp, where we're looking at the coughing index of the pig. So if you look closely, you'll see a microphone hanging up um, and that is continually recording the uh, respiratory index of the pigs and it lets us know about two weeks before you see clinical signs if the pigs are going to get sick. So to summarize, we have to promote, provide more people with healthy, nutritious pork and have a less impact on environmental and natural resources. And some of you, if you sign up to the Farmers Journal Ag Science Study Guides, my latest video, which I did last week, was looking at sustainability. So you can see what we do on farm to, to be more sustainable. Um, we have to be adaptable to changes in climate, consumer demand and disease risk, while also continually improving pig health and welfare. So thank you very much for, for the opportunity to talk to you all today. Um, as George mentioned, he follows me on, on Twitter. So you can, you can follow me on Twitter. Um, also try and use Facebook and, and Instagram a lot to promote pig farming and, and, and news related to pig farms and what we're doing here on the farm. So feel free to check that out as well. So thanks very much. Shane, thanks a million. That was really informative. Um, you'll see there in the Q and A, there's a couple of questions mm -hmm. that come in. Yeah. Um, so Neve, there, why are teaser boars not also used for breeding? Um, the teaser boars aren't used for breeding because they would be of you know lesser genetic quality. So boars that we have uh, that that come from the AI stations are really high merit boars, um, and and they're you know that they're bred. Many of them are imported from abroad, from, from Denmark, for example. So um, the teaser boards are just used for teasing because they wouldn't be of, um, of that genetic merit. Okay. Um, um, how is the cost of using AI more efficient than using boards on site? Yeah, so I suppose, again, it's the gen genetic merit. They're really high performing uh, boards that we're getting the AI from. So that's giving us benefits, you know, production wise, be it, you know, higher born alive in, in the cells uh, and, and other parameters that we'd be looking at. Um, so, and of course, from a management point of view, it's much, much easier um, to be doing AI. And I think the lads probably actually just inseminating behind me because down right below is the, is the service area. So it is a very simple process, not as dangerous as having to use a bore for natural mating. All right, okay. And um, the optimum temperatures then for weaning houses and finishing houses? Yeah, so we use air to water heat pumps um, for the heating pads here on, on the farm. And the best way I use to describe them is that they're like hot water bottles because the water is heated and the piglets are laying on it. So the day that we're weaning pigs, which is on a Monday, we would have the room turned on and the heating turned on. And it goes to a temperature of about 26, 27 degrees for them. And we have uh, canopies. So the canopies are kept on for the first four weeks after weaning to help uh, conserve that, that temperature. And then when they move to the finisher section, then um, when they're older, we don't have to have heating down there because they're generating the heat themselves. And it's usually at about 20, 21 degrees for the finisher houses. Right. Okay. And um, what breeds are you using? Um, predominantly Landrace, Large White Crosses, also a bit of Duroc. Okay. And from Eileen there, can you explain a little bit more about the interdermal vaccination? Yeah, so there's no needle on it. And it's, it's basically, um, it's done by pressure. So it's a gun that is, um, th that has, I don't know, I've got one here near me, I can show you, no. But um, it, it's just basically done by pressure. Um, it's battery operated. And when you press it into the skin of the piglet, 
um, the, the vaccine just goes straight through into the skin. Good. Um, and sure, we might, even if you look on your Instagram page, there might be pictures of that up there, is there? Or? There is, and I can certainly put it up on the story there as well for anyone who wants to see it. Yeah, yeah. No, it's great to be able to show the students in, in class. Yeah. Um, and then how does management data get put onto the RFIP chips? Yeah, so that is done through Bluetooth. So each uh, person in, in, in different sections of the farm have their own PDA and it just automatically updates via Bluetooth onto the system. So we have that on, on the PDAs and then it also goes to the computer. Okay, good. And how do you manage waste? Um, waste, well, I suppose the main part we would, uh, the main output would be slurry. But to us, that's not a waste. It's a valuable natural fertilizer. And we're very lucky here in Kerry that there's no other pig farms because it is a really valuable fertilizer. Um, that other farmers use. So we would have a truck that's delivering pig slurry to you know, dairy and beef farmers in the local area. We also have our own tractors um, delivering slurry too for people and, and spreading it on our, on our own land. So on our beef farms, we actually don't use any chemical fertilizer. So you know, slurry is not a waste. Um, I suppose any other outputs, um, you know, it, it, it's quite minimal. You know, we have the, the, the local, um, the local bean collection company collects the, the, the rubbish every week from the skip. That's about it really from, from a waste perspective. But of course, you know, things like needles and, and stuff like that, that goes into the, des the designated Sharpies bins, and then that gets incinerated at a special uh, management uh, waste management facility. Okay, very good. And um, students must conduct a scientific study around conservation of the environment. From a pig industry point of view, are there any obvious areas of improving conservation of the environment? Yeah, so that's something that I talked a lot about in the, um, the Farmers Journal AgriWare. I asked a study guide last week. Uh, I didn't want to go into sustainability here, but like we're using um, rainwater harvesting systems here. So rainwater is collected from all the roofs and then held in an underground storage tank. And we reuse that water for washing. Um, again, like the air to water heat pumps, that's renewable. Um, we have uh, LED lighting throughout the farm. So there's lots of things that we do and other farmers do um, to, to um, conserve the environment, uh, like solar panels as well. That's something that, that's quite popular. Okay, very good. And we're, <clears throat> we're recording this presentation. Um, is it all right that it, we'd show this to students when we go back? Yes, yeah. yeah, of course, no problem. They'd love it. Because um, I think, well, I know my students anyway love studying pigs because it, we're predominantly a dairy and a beef area, mm -hmm. you know, so anything different, as you'd say. Yeah. Um, a question there from Teresa. Um, can you tell us about the production of your own food? Of my own? So uh, I suppose that must be from a, a truly Irish perspective. Um, so Truly Irish was a brand that was set up by pig farmers about uh, 10, 11, 12 years ago now after the pork dioxin crisis because there was so much imported pig meat left on the shelves that we had all presumed was Irish because it was from Irish household names and brands. So pig farmers came together to set up their own brand uh, and Truly Irish is not just a name, it's, it's our guarantee. It doesn't compromise quality for profit. It's very much a premium pig meat product and everything is outsourced. So basically, uh, Truly Irish has uh, uh, a processor who's doing the bacon and doing the rashers to our spec. And then the other company is doing our sausages and our puddings to our spec. So Truly Irish does, is not an actual you know, factory itself or a processor. It is merely, um, you know, it merely has the, the brand and has the spec for the products. And then that is, is carried out then by our secondary processors and you know it, it's then available in, in all the, the leading supermarkets so that's how it, it, it gets to shelf and for the pig meat to come from truly Irish farms those processors only buy pigs from truly Irish suppliers so that's how we ensure that um, it's, it's all truly Irish farmers and of course Irish pig meat is traceable by DNA so the IFA can pick up any piece of pig meat in a supermarket or butchers around the country and they can check the DNA of that a piece of pork to check if it's Irish or not. So that's a very useful tool that we have in Ireland. And that's predominantly because of not having boars on site because every boar has the DNA, has a DNA tag. So here we only have four boars. So it's very easy for us to send four DNA tags to the, to, uh, the IFA's head office uh, because it's very easy to control from that point of view. 
Okay, very good. Um, I can't type in a question on myself, but I have a few people texting me about um, <laughs> um, diseases, you know, as in you mentioned at the start, like your, the diseases on your farm will be different, but like we'll say we we'll be teaching that they need to know one bacterial, one viral and um, one fungal disease. So what would be those common diseases maybe? You'd want um, to bacterial disease, uh, streptococcus uh, meningitis, that's one that would be... Uh, an ongoing concern and as now as we're kind of moving to reducing and eliminating antibiotics from from pigs like you know we're only using antibiotics here for for treating pigs and you know we're very much producing pigs without the use of antibiotics but there's challenges in that in that you will get higher uh, incidences of streptococcus meningitis so that's something we're we're trying to work on hard at the moment to minimize um, because we obviously don't want to be giving um, antibiotics to the whole batch of pigs when it's just a small few that are coming down with, with streptococcus. Um, a viral disease would be uh, PWRS, which I mentioned, or PERS. That's uh, porcine respiratory uh, reproductive um, syndrome virus, or commonly known as blue ear. And then a fungal disease, I suppose, would be um, mange, you know, anything related to the skin. Um, fungal infections not really that that common in, in pigs but you know anything you know to do with the skin mange would probably be one yeah okay great Shane thanks a million no um, problem it was really, really and you'll see all the comments there now like so so positive um just before I hand um over to Joe we're delighted Shaw Scientific have um given us two prizes a weather station and um a voucher um, Darren Cunningham, and if you get in contact with Darren, um, like any teachers that are here, he'll give you a discount code. We'll put his email address into the chat function there. So, would you mind picking a number between one and two hundred and thirty-nine? Any number. <laughs> um, one hundred and fifty. One hundred and fifty. <laughs> so, I think um, we have. Um, everyone that registered got um, an, a number as you'd say and they will tell us then who the number 150 is excellent so, if you're not in you can't win <laughs> and i think you have to be attending in order to to get it <laughs> uh, michelle uh 100 number 150 is ashling raymond who i do think is actually here so brilliant okay so uh, i'll put a little message to ashling in the Super. in the in the chat and we'll get her email address and we'll contact her Perfect. great excellent. thanks a million Okay, thanks, Joe. Our thanks, Shane. We'll I'll hand thanks, you over. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, thanks again, Shane, for that great presentation. Um, just before we move on to the farmer shorter for the next one, we'd just like to welcome Lorraine Hall from Lettertech. Lorraine has written a new ag science book, uh, Rooting for Knowledge, and she's going to do a quick promo for that new book. Lorraine. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, work away, Lorraine. Yeah, perfect. Um, so, hi, just to introduce myself first, um, my name's Lorraine Hawk, um, and I'm the author of Rooting for Knowledge, the new ag science book that's coming into classrooms this September. Um, so, I began teaching, you'll notice if you've gotten a copy of Rooting for Knowledge um, as a sample, that it's a bit different to most textbooks that you see. Um, I began teaching with this style about two years ago. Um, I found that in ag science in particular, there's a huge variability in both ability and the type of experience and the level of experience that students have with agriculture. Because of this, I try to use a lot of discussion and scaffolding questions to build on the previous knowledge that they have and have students support each other in their learning as well by sharing their experiences. Um, I don't like to give out just typed up, handed out notes to students because I find that it can be quite passive. And some students are going to uh, have it sit in front of them. And then once it goes into their bag, they're never going to look at it again. And a year and a half later, when it comes to the Leaving Cert, they're asking you for copies because they don't have notes on anything. Um, I found, so because of that, what I was doing was I was getting students to write things out, but I found that it was taking an awful lot of time in particular for students who had literacy issues or SEN such as dyslexia. I thought that um, they were really struggling with it and that impacted the students that might've been stronger or very fast at it as well because they were kind of just sitting around waiting for students to, other students to be finished. Um, so I had a discussion with my ag science class at the time and they felt like it was taking away from the amount of material we could cover in a class. 
So I started designing notes um, that were in the same structure as uh, the book, which if you see um, in it, there are examples here, there are spaces throughout the book for the students to write in. Uh, so the book comes with PowerPoints that match up perfectly with it. And there's spaces for students to write so that the students have to follow along the topic and engage with the material as you're scaffolding the learning with questions and discussions and sharing other um, experiences with them. There are also questions throughout the book to link the material to other areas of the curriculum and challenge the students as they look at the topic. So asking them to go back over things that they've already learned to try and instill that information to them and get them to remember it. At the end of each chapter as well, there are links to the cross-cutting themes, not necessarily all eight in every chapter, but um, ones that are particularly relevant to that topic. So they can see how the cross-cutting themes relate to each other and relate to the individual topic as well. Along with the student book, there's also a teacher book. The teacher book is the exact same as the student book. The difference being the spaces are actually filled in uh, so that the teacher never has to worry about whether or not the, um, the students know what they have to write in. They have everything there if the students need extra support but it's on the PowerPoint anyway. So if you have those, you can use that to help them fill it in too. Um, there are also extra materials that come along with that as well. So each chapter has a test and a marking scheme done to the best of my ability anyway, in the style of the questions from the sample paper and looking at developing those further. So trying to link it in with other topics, having the spaces for them to write in so they get used to the structure and the style of the questions. Each chapter also comes with a crossword to help them learn um, the key terms and the definitions and what they mean and extra activities as well that vary depending on the topic. If you've gotten your sample, you'll see there you get um, a code so that you can go on and look at a sample of the extra activities. Uh, one example is just a nitrogen cycle, getting them to move around the pieces of the nitrogen cycle to link it up and physically have them working um, to try and learn the material. Uh, lastly, there's just also a lab book that comes along with the book. So there's a student lab book and a teacher lab book. They are very similar. Um, each experiment has the method, but also has the spaces for it to fill in health and safety aspects of the experiment, independent and dependent variables, if it's a variable experiment, spaces to fill in results and discussions. And at the end of each experiment, there are scientific practice questions to link the experiment to um, the first strand on scientific practices and relevant to agriculture questions to link the experiment into the topic that it connects to and other topics on the course as well. There's also at the end of the lab book, um, there are IIS uh, support materials for helping them develop and fill out their project. So there are suggested experiments, ways to come up with a research question, flowcharts to ensure the research question um, is supporting or aligned with the theme and will help them develop their IIS to the best of their ability. The teacher lab book is very similar, but there are just some extra materials on preparing the experiments, um, preparing chemicals, in highlighting the independent and dependent variables so that you know what to show the students and some extra materials just for keeping track of your the individual students individual investigative uh, study where you can just keep checklists to make sure they've submitted and that you've corrected and different parts of that to help you support your students during the IIS. And so the book is published by a company called Lettertech. And if you buy directly from Lettertech for your class, it's 25 euro for the student book and the lab book together. If students go and buy it directly themselves, it's an extra 30 because of the delivery um, to them rather than the delivery to the school. Um, I think that's it. Sorry if I'm talking too fast. And if anyone has any questions, feel free. Okay. So thanks very much, Lorraine, and to best of luck with your book. And um, if we have any questions coming in, we might get to, to you later on. Is that okay? So uh, now we'd just like to welcome Jack Kennedy, 
Adam Woods, Dr. Siobhan Walsh and Aidan Brennan from the Farmers Journal. So Jack is very used to holding the tech talks and panel discussions with the tech talks with the Farmers Journal. And today he's going to go through the genetics learning outcomes for us with his expert panel. Um, we encourage all teachers to send in their questions again and we'll put them to Jack and the panel at the end of the session. Over to you, Jack. OK, thank you very much, Joe. Um, I thought for a while there at the start when George was, was talking that you had to be from Kerry to get a look in today, he started mentioning um, uh, Shane and of course uh, who gave a very good presentation obviously and Norma Foley and I said like to myself um, we've no one from Kerry on our panel Adam Woods you can see there is from County Cavan in the in the west northeast as he keeps telling us on, on uh, Farm Tech Talk Aidan Brennan is Tipperary and Siobhan Walsh is with us as well um, and Siobhan is from County Leash so we have we have Cavan uh, Leash and Tipperary represented on our on our panel so Joe, if, if it's okay with you, I, first of all, I we were going to maybe, obviously, the, 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 the kind of what we want to have is a little bit of a chat more than anything else and lots of questions and answers um, with the panel rather than kind of a presentation. So, I mean, genetics and I suppose the learning outcomes are, are key for kind of that whole section on, gen, on genetics. And I was going to maybe have a chat with Adam Woods first in terms of, I suppose, the, the, the beef side of the house in terms of the genetics and run down through the kind of the four learning outcomes. Then I was going to go to Aidan Brennan and kind of, I suppose, mirror that on the with a, with a dairy, through a dairy lens, and then move into Siobhan and look at genetics in terms of the crop lens and see where we are there. So we spent, spent a couple of minutes at that and then we come, come, back, to, come back to the wider group for, for plenty of questions to you. That'd be the, that's the plan, Joe, if, if that works for you. Um, yeah. So, um, Adam, um, the, the, the four the four learning, yeah, Grant, um, the four learning outcomes are up there on on a screen. There's a there's a there's a, there's, there's um, a slide there showing the four outcomes. It was it was the next slide there in the there we go. Um, it's probably very small, is it? But anyway, I mean, look, I, I think everyone on the teachers, everyone, all the teachers are going to know that the for the learning outcomes. Adam, we, we quickly go down fertilization of any learning outcome. Yeah, so so that's on, on point number one there, Jack. Yeah, yeah just run down it, yeah. those. Yeah, so so performance testing. Um, I I guess that's um in terms of you know we would have ran some performance testing in Tully and uh, ICB. Oh, sorry, are, are you working off this slide or the, or the previous one? No, I, I'm working off the the, fir the first one. Is, 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 it, is yeah, describe the mammalian. See the number one yes, here. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. Describe the male reproductive cycle and methods of fertilization of any two animals. So just kind of the, the basics of reproduction, I suppose, and in, in, in the beef side of things. Yeah, so I, I guess on the suckler side of things, Jack, it's similar to dairy. We have a three-week cycle um, in the suckler cow. Um, that cow comes into heat. She displays signs of heat. Um, we'll say at day, we'll say 21, for, for example. Um, that will be, we'll say, rising on other cows, maybe sliming behind, um, showing, you know, agitation or whatever, um, and standing, a standing heat. Um, so, so farmers are very in tune with those signs of heat. Um, and then we'll say AI can take place or, or stock bull natural mating will take place uh, around that time of heat. Um, hopefully in terms of, I guess, conception then will occur where, where the sperm makes contact with the, with the egg. Um, and then we'll say gestation, your standard gestation in, in, the, in the suckler end of the house um, is probably 286 days for a Charlie, maybe 289 for a, for a limousine, and maybe a little bit less for an Angus or a Hereford. Um, in terms of, I suppose, conception rate, you're probably looking maybe between 60 and 70 percent. You'd hope for, for AI um, and, and stock bull maybe a little bit higher. Um, and, but that's basically it. it it's, it's quite simple. Um, I suppose the challenges on the suckler side of the house are that sometimes we have a long period after the cow calves before she resumes cycling. Um, and that's to do maybe with the cow and the calf bond, that the calf is actually uh, sucking the cow. So, so her, her hormone balance um, isn't the same maybe as a dairy cow in terms of the dairy cow will come back into heat maybe a lot quicker. And that, that leaves a challenge on the suckler end of the house in terms of getting that uh, cow back and calf to calf within 365 days uh, again and a lot of our farmers have a real challenge with doing that um, and that's one of our key parameters when we're assessing farm performance that that a cow calves every every 12 months we need her to calve every 12 months um, so, th so that's Jack I suppose maybe widen it out a little bit beyond maybe the mammalian reproductive cycle but but that's it in a nutshell. Okay, Adam, like, I mean, that summarizes it. Aiden, I mean, in terms of the, the, the dairy side of things, there's, there's no real differences. We're talking about a, a bovine animal, a cow again, and, and a bull the same way. There's probably the one difference is there's a lot more AI used on the dairy side of things. 
Yeah, sure. Like biologically, they're the same animal, only the dairy animal is bred more for milk production, uh, compared, and whereas the beef animal is more for, for meat production. Um, I, yeah, you're right, like Jack, a lot more AI used in the dairy herd. So I think upwards of 80% of, of, uh, of dairy uh, replacement heifers are now by AI. I, I think that's the figure anyway. It's increasing increasing quite dramatically. Um, and look, I mean, the reason for that, Jack, is like, you know, the, 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 the genetic performance of an AI animal is far superior to the genetic performance of a, of, of a natural stock bull or natural service stock bull. So that's yeah. the, the main reason. Okay, we'll move very quickly uh, uh, again into the kind of out learning outcome number two. Explain the importance of genetics in, in food producing and, and other animals. Um, so Adam, the, the importance of genetics in, in food producing and, and other animals, again, just from the kind of the sucker kind of through a beef lens, you know, talk to me about that. Yeah, Jack, I, I suppose just when Aidan mentioned 80% there, we're, we're actually back at 20 to 25% to AI progeny in the suckler herd. So we have, we have a huge progress there to make in the suckler herd. Yeah, so in terms of, I suppose, the important genetics, um, really important. It's a central pillar to farm performance. So if we're going out to assess a farm or look at a farm plan, you know, genetics will be front and center of that in terms of how it can be improved um, on a farm. And the reason for that is, I guess, you have a couple of key maybe traits there. You, you have sort of two separate pillars in, in the beef world. You've either what we call the replacement index, which takes into effect the, the milk and fertility and the we'll say the maternal side of the house in terms of the cow, we'll say traits that we want. And then we have the terminal index, which and they, that takes in, we'll say carcass traits, carcass conformation, um, carcass weight. Uh, and those those indexes, we'll say genetics form, you know, a, a lot of, of, of those indexes in terms of using those indexes on the farm. So a farmer can pick a bull that's, that's good on maternal traits if he wants to breed or she wants to breed replacements or uh, they can pick a bull if, if they're selling weanlands or finishing cattle they can pick a bull uh, on that terminal index and genetics will have a huge influence on that if, if we pick a very maternal bull that has a lot of milk and a lot of fertility they might not be as good in terms of carcass traits or, or they might not have, have as good a confirmation whereas if we pick a terminal bull they would be very good we'll see you'll be getting maybe u type progeny or type progeny very heavy progeny and, and well we'll say conformed and well finished and and they come into good money in the end of the day in the factory but a farmer has to decide which road they want to go i guess if, if we take tullamore farm we're looking for a balanced sort of approach there that we have we have milk and fertility in the cow but yet the male progeny from that cow also has good terminal traits so it's about finding a balance there on the, on the sucker side Aiden, on the genetic side, in terms of the dairy side of it, looking through a dairy lens? Sure, it's, it's massive, Jack. Like, I mean, if, if you have two animals in the one herd and there's a difference in their production or fertility performance, uh, that's more or less all down to genetics, you know? I mean, because that's, that's the reason for it. So, I mean, I, I think the figure we used to kind of go on is about 50% of an animal's performance is down to genetics and the other 50% is down to management. Um, but like, it's huge. Like, I mean, it's absolutely, the, the, and the difference that that will have then on, on terms of farm profitability is also massive. So um, you can't and be understated. And so you're using genetics then to produce more fat and protein, to get better fertility, to get better health traits in your dairy cows. They're the key ones. And I mean, we're, we're working off the index, uh, which is our economic breeding index. And so every animal and every dairy animal in the country has an EBI and that's the economic breeding index. And um, every bull has one as well. So uh, you're trying to pick uh, the highest EBI bulls you can and breed them to the highest EBI cows you have. And then your, your progeny that are going to be high EBI. They're the ones that are most profitable. So that's a, an economic value in that animal. Okay. Adam, the, the principle, the learning output number three is describe the principles of genetic improvement and selection. And they're listed then as performance testing, physical traits, progeny testing, genotyping, natural selection, and genetic engineering we're not going to have time to go down through all this i don't think we should because we're, we're using up too much time of the q a so i mean with th those principles of genetic improvement like i mean they're, they're developments they're they're kind of i suppose pieces that are changing constantly in terms of what's happening from year to year in terms of trying to select better sires to kind of improve genetic to, to make to make genetics better Absolutely, Jack, and I suppose if we could single out one, maybe it's, it's progeny testing because that really filters back data into the ICBF database. So, so if we take, for example, what's going on in Tully at the moment, they will select a panel of, of AI bulls or Gene Ireland bulls, and they'll use the progeny from those bulls to test and the performance test uh, within, within Tully. That data then filters back into the index and, and it adds, I suppose, reliability and it adds some proof to whether it would say that bull is actually delivering uh, and what does what it says on the tin, basically. Uh, 
for, for the performance of those animals. In terms of physical traits, you have a lot of linear scoring takes place in pedigree herds where a linear scorer will come out and he will give the animal a score at a 10 for the length of its, it will say the length of the carcass, length of the width of the back, we'll say in terms of height, in terms of weight. Uh, so, that, so the animal will get a score based on that, that physical trait. Genotyping and gen genomic selection, obviously BDGP forms a huge part of that. Um, we, we have 2.3 million genotypes now in, in the ICBF database, 1.3 billion pieces of data. We're really, we're, we're punching way above our weight in terms of the amount of data that we have in that ICBF index. And, and to be honest, Jack, we're the envy of the world in terms of looking at that whole system that we have and that ICBF have in terms of link ups to factories, link up to marts, link up to farmers, getting all the data in from farms um, and building those indexes. Um, so, so really, we're, we're in a great place in terms of where we're going because we're out in front as regards genotyping and genomic selection. Aiden, through the dairy lens, again, all those kind of, I call it, parameters and principles of, of genetic improvement, they, like, they are there to say they're there for the dairy world as well. Yeah, if you look back over the last 20 years, there's been two big changes in dairy breeding in Ireland. The first is the introduction of EBI, which was 20 years ago. And the second one then is the widespread introduction of genomics, which was about 10 years ago. So like nearly every, like the vast majority, I think something like 70% of, uh, of inseminations in the dairy world are to a genomically, um, gen a, a genomically, uh, a genomic proof of a bull. I can't think of the word I'm trying to use. And um, the, I suppose the, re the, re the reason why that has such groundbreaking significance is that you can fast forward um, the amount of, of this progeny testing, which Adam referred to. So the, rather than doing uh, eight or 10 years of, of testing on, on, the, on the young heifers, the genotype will tell you in an instant uh, what the genetic potential of that animal is. Yeah, so genotype, as you say, it's fast tracking the genetic, the genetic, genetic improvement um, and using that through the DNA in terms of what the, rather than just the parent, parental average or the, what, the, what the parents are doing, you can see it in terms of the DNA. Um, we'll probably come back to that in the questions and answers. Fourthly, then, the, and the last learning outcome is recognize the role and importance of innovation and biotech in animal science. A Adam, you know, in terms of some of the changes and some of the innovation, we've talked about one, I'd say genotyping and genomic selection. That, that's, for me, that's, a, that's an innovation, that's a biotech. What else is happening on the, on the supper on the beef side? Yeah, I guess you've, you've got, we'll say, scientists in ICBF and, and, and Chagas looking at, you know, disease and, and looking at certain bulls that, that could maybe, you know, be TB resistant, for example. Um, and, and I suppose this 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 is a space that's moving all the time. Like you, you've got sex semen there. Um, you, you, I often thought about on the suckler side of things, if, if, if you had a herd of cows that were that were quite milky, could twinning play a role in, in, in the suckler side of the house in terms of, you know, breeding cows that, that would deliver twins? Because there are cows out there that maybe have a lot of milk. And, and they could rear maybe two calves and, and that could you know really help the output of a suckler herd and um, maybe that's a bit off the wall jack but definitely i don't think it, it's moving all the time and probably the animal disease um and and also maybe dna testing of all calves or all all animals in ireland i think we're, we're heading that way and in terms of maybe marketing our beef in the future that'd be a, a you know a bulletproof way of, of showing that we're, we're completely traceable um from birth to slaughter Aiden, again, on the dairy side, again, it, it's, it's hugely important. Yeah, so we, we mentioned uh, genomics. The next one there, as Adam has mentioned, is sex semen. Uh, so about 4% of inseminations last year were to sex semen, and I see that's going to increase uh, over the next couple of years. And really, so, <clears throat> so you're, you're predetermining the sex of the calf uh, at insemination time, and usually for, it's for heifers that we, that we want, and that'll allow more beef uh, calves to be born. So you can use higher uh, higher rate of higher value beef calves because you don't need to be using as many um, dairy inseminations. And the other one, thing, which is a new thing, and it's happened, there's studies going on this at the moment, is the whole area of IVF. So we've had embryo transfer for a good while, but this is uh, using, I suppose, more human, um, the more human te technology around uh, IVF and that. So you can actually uh, you can implant um, a fetus and and that into um, into dairy cows. So that's happening. There's studies going on at the moment. Embryos, I suppose, rather than fetuses. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So I mean, that that's a very quick snapshot of the kind of, and we've gone down through the learning outcomes in terms of the genetics, in terms of the animal science world. I mean, Siobhan, if we can just again, there's, there's five learning outcomes in terms of the genetics, in terms of the crop section, um, and, and maybe uh, very quickly again, we can go down them and then maybe take a couple of quick questions and answers after that. I mean, the, the principles of the, describe the genetic, the principles of genetic improvement and selection. The, so again, like the um, animal science side, we have performance testing, physical traits, progeny testing, genotyping, and natural, natural selection. Talk to us about some of those on the crop side of things. 
Yeah, I suppose for our main crops in Ireland, Jack, like, you know, cereals, as you know, beans, a lot of our varieties would come initially from the UK um, and Europe, places like Denmark, France, Germany. Um, so we take varieties from those countries. So the seed houses here in Ireland, like Goldcroft, Seed Tech, Drum and Germinal, um, they might have um, a thousand plots in a screening trial um, every year and they'll screen those those plots for basic things like septoria, lodging, breakdown. Um, and then the, the plots, these are only little small plots, those plots then um, the, the varieties that make it will go into larger plots that be tested for, for their yield. Um, and it's very important that we have that going on in this country um, because really varieties are only tested for things like disease, like septoria, which are really important for, for farmers' incomes and yields here in Ireland um, when they get to Ireland because of our weather system. So we can produce really high yields here, um, but the, the diseases might might play better in, in France or the UK or wherever. Um, so, and then once the variety, the, the likes of seed tech or gold crop have the, the trial screens, then they move on to the Department of Agriculture. Um, and that's where they're, they're, they're tested there again. So, so really, Siobhan, what, what you're saying is that, you know, these up and coming crops or these new crops or new varieties, they need to be tested here in an Irish scenario so that the Irish environment, the rain, the wind, the, the issues that affect crop kind of yield and persistency, that, that they need to be tested on the ground here in Ireland, you know, not in France, because they, they mightn't actually perform the same way here in Ireland. Yeah, so we're not, we're not um, you know, genotyping things here in, in Ireland. We are for potatoes and grasses, but as regards um, our bigger crops, we're not. So like, and it's a long process, so it could take 10 years for a variety to get to market. So out of the out of 20 to 30,000 um, varieties developed by breeders in those countries, maybe one or two will get to market. Of the, of maybe one in 100 that actually come to Ireland will get to market by the time they're screened for all those traits here. Okay, uh, learning outcome number two on the crop side is understand the principles of genetic e engineering, identifying genes in characterized crop genomes and understanding how they produce proteins to tackle specific crop diseases. So drill into that a little bit, Sean, or uh, Siobhan, just in terms of kind of an understanding of what, what, that, what that's about. Yeah, look, here in Ireland, we, we, we can't use um, genetic modification. We can't use gene editing. Um, and we see crops around the world where they do. So in America, they have GM and they have gene editing. So, you know, you have BT corn. So BT corn is um, where you have a bac bacteria bacillus and something starting with a T. Um, and that creates a protein um, that's toxic to insects. So in America, they cut out their insect juice on their corn because they have this BT corn, this GM corn. Um, and I suppose a lot of GM now, we're moving to gene editing. So gene editing, um, I kind of describe it as a natural process. It's, it's, it speeds up the natural selection process, probably a better way to, to put it. So instead of transplanting, we had like we had a GM potato try in an oak park. And in that trial, um, we it, there was a, a gene from a wild potato transferred into a commercial potato. And they were able to cut the fungicide use by 80 to 90%. So in Ireland, we... Um, we spray our potatoes once a week um, at certain times of the year. So while we're not we're, while we're not allowed to, to do that here in Ireland, that's that's what can come from from the use of the GM. The gene editing then, I suppose, so it speeds up the process and it happens in the plant. So you're not actually transferring um, genes from one to the other. You're using bacteria and protein to to make SNPs in the plant. Um, so it's kind of just speed okay. up the natural process. And I suppose we've made, so when we can, when we can look at, like in the potato program in Oak Park, um, where you can genotype the potato and use marker selection, you can speed up, um, you can speed up the breeding process. And like this year now we have um, Gio winter barley. So that, 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 was, that was bred naturally, but I suppose the, the developments in genetics have allowed that to be developed a little bit faster. So Gio now is um, tolerant to, it's a, it's a BYDB tolerant variety. So aphids um, cause barley yellow dwarf virus. So now we, we lost neonicotinides um, there two, two, three years ago. So we, can, we now have a, vari a variety where we don't need to spray aphicide in the winter. And the same with Combiso beef. So it's, they're, they're, they're similar type of things where we can, we can spray a normal herbicide on beef to kill weedy beef. Okay, so I mean, you've gone through. I think the learning outcome number three as well is it kind of appreciate the role of innovation mm -hmm. and biotech. 
you're kind of move, you're moving. But I mean, again, they're just all examples, as you say, of trying to make the plant more sustainable to try and make the health of the plant better, we'll say, um, so that you can get kind of effectively get a better yield and that the inputs that the farmer puts into it is getting, you're getting a better return. Um, in terms of learning outcome number, number four, evaluate the ethical and economic considerations and arguments arising from biotech applications as applied to crop management, for, for example, genetic enhancement of crop varieties against pests diseases using to yeah so again you've touched off it in some suppose gene editing and gene modification it's allowed in the us not in the eu so i mean just give us again a line we'll say on the ethical and economic considerations of what, for what that means in terms of the biotech applications yes yeah, so look it's, it's some of that's kind of a political debate as well you know um science you know we see no reason why we shouldn't be able to use gene editing certainly here in Europe, and the, the EU Commission have gone back and reviewed that now. So it was basically a political decision taken. They said, right, we're going to classify gene editing in the same way as we classify genetically modified organisms. And we know they're not the same. You're not transferring a fish into, into barley to, or into wheat to have omega in your, in your flour. Like. Um, so the EU are now going back and they're, they're reviewing that. So maybe in time we will have gene edited crops and that's, that's going to be really important, Jack, because we're losing chemistry all the time. We have farmed fork coming from the EU where we have to reduce our fungicides. So we, in reality, we need new technologies. We won't be able to continue to grow crops unless we have new technology. You're gone there, Jack, are you? So learning <coughs> from number five then. Okay, and, the, and the progress of saying, yeah. Um, the, 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 the last one, um, Siobhan, is to investigate the complexity associated with genetic inheritance of traits by hybridize, hybridizing or crossbreeding, I suppose, is what we call it on the, on the animal side of things. Like So investigate the complexity of crossbreeding two varieties to determine the rate of transfer of the required trait, um, e.g. petal color to the next progeny. So how that piece works, like we'll say, in terms of, of uh, the, the rate of transfer? Um, yeah, as, as in the speed, is it Jack? Like, or yeah, um, I suppose yeah. we've talked we've talked about it a little bit already. Um, um, like it's we we've seen things speed up now. Like in the potato breeding program in Oak like potato breeding is is known for being really slow. So the fact that we can genotype those those uh, the DNA now and use marker selection, um, it's it's speeded up the process that maybe would have been in taken six years. We can now do it over over two seasons where you can weed out, using marker selection, you can weed out the varieties that don't have the traits that you want. Um, and you can do that um, a lot quicker in things like grasses because you're able to grow a lot more in one year. Like you can do a few different crosses in a year, um, okay. if that answers the question. Okay. Um... Okay, th thanks, Siobhan. No, I think I think we've enough. And if there's, if there's questions there, they, I mean, they, I think they can come into the questions and answers. Uh, Joe, I'm looking at the the Q Q and A box, and there's a couple of questions in there, and I might flick through them if it was okay. Joe, is that is that the way we go? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the first one there, I suppose, Jack is from Genevieve. It's, is genomic selection of bulls as good as traditional method of proving bulls? Yeah, and so I'll say it's not one or the other. I'll hand over to Aidan now in a minute. I'll say it's not one or the other. And really, genomic runs alongside the proven method. You know, that you, it's a combination of both that really makes genomic selection good. Aidan, talk to us on that, on the dairy side. Yeah, so the reliability of a genomic bull is going to be less than a daughter proven bull, but they have a higher EBI because you're fast forwarding genetic gain. So, you know, one genomically, uh, one genomic bull is equivalent to three or four years of genetic gain uh, with daughter, you know, with using a daughter proven bull. So, uh, high, they're higher EBI animals um, is a result of genomics. So, it's, it's um, the accuracy is a little bit less, but the value of the, you know, and on average, they, they, they actually hold their, uh, their EBI value. But and the individual and, bulls could rise and fall. And, and Aidan, it's, it's, it's fair to say that, like, you know, uh, the, the genomic piece, it, it kind of, uh, it, it's the early stage of, of, of the proven bulls. Like, I mean, they'll go on, the, those bulls will go on and they'll get the kind of traditional method of proving, you know, once they get, in, get into their lactation and produce, start producing milk, etc. Yeah, and that'll help then the genomic proof. So yeah. the more information we have, it, that's it's they call that the training population, and they're adding more and more data to the training population the whole time. And uh, the more of that we have, the better the genomic proof will be, the higher the reliability will be. Yeah. So it's still, you know, it's still only really ten years into this track, and um, the, the the amount of animals in the country being genotyped is increasing yearly. So we're going to get better information as time goes on. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, next question in here um, from Dave Fogarty. Has sex semen far to go before it becomes reliable enough to become commonplace on dairy farms? So I'll take that again, I suppose, yeah, Jack. Um, the, <laughs> so on average, sex semen has lower conception rates than conventional semen. But within that, there are within the, the Chagas studies, there are some farms and, and that are actually performing better than conventional semen with sex semen. Uh, so farmers in, are, uh, in Chagas have come up with uh, reasons why that could be. So if you follow fairly strict protocols, you can actually get uh, as good, if not better, conception rates with sex semen as you can with conventional semen. And Aidan, a lot of that comes back to, you know, the, the, the cows that you're using sex semen on. It's not all the fault of the sex semen. If you have a really fertile herd and you pick out the high fertility animals in that herd, you can get, you can get very good results with sex semen, as you say. Yeah, that's kind of the, that's that's the point I was trying to make. I suppose Jack, I should, I should have expanded expanded that further. Like you're picking cows that are in good body condition score. They've uh, they're in between first lactation and fourth lactation, and they've calved more than fifty days, and they have been cycling already. So really, this is probably the cows that have the highest chance of going in calf. You're giving them sex semen, and um, and you're also allowing them a slightly later. So the shelf life of 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 sex semen in the uterus is that bit uh, less than conventional semen, so it doesn't last as long. So you need to be um, getting it in there uh, around the time that the egg is, is, is after ovulation. So you're just going to meet a better chance of that eating the egg. Yeah. And just on that, Aidan, is it possible to get sex male semen for the male beef calves? Well, I'm sure it is. I haven't seen it. It's not, it's not in the dairy world. Adam might be a better place than that. Adam, can you get a sex yeah. male? You, you can, yeah, Aidan, you can. You can get sex male and sex female semen um, at the moment. Um, yeah, and I, so that can be used in, in, in the dairy herd as well as the beef herd. The problem is at the moment in terms of getting good genetics that are sex because um, maybe AI stations, they reduce the number of maybe uh, straws they can sell uh, by sex in a bull. But I think that will change in the future that they'll start to sex maybe better bulls in the future. Yeah, so it is possible, as you say, Adam, and they, that's maybe one of the benefits, maybe from the, on the sucker side of it, that you get more male animals which have a better growth hormone in, you know, naturally, I call it. Isn't that fair to say? And that if you wanted to do bulls or bull beef or whatever, you could have more bulls on your farm, on your sucker farm. Yeah, absolutely, mm -hmm. Jack. Or, or the other way around, if, if you wanted to be make sure if you're using maternal genetics that you really want to get a heifer and people get very disappointed when they see uh, something with testicles coming out. So it, mm -hmm. it's maybe if using sex, you know, female semen um, mm -hmm. it, it will, will guarantee a heifer. It, it could be good as well. Yeah. OK, there's a few just coming in here on text as well here to me. To, so, so learning five there and the plants ones is a specified practical activity. So we would have to it's an experiment we'd have to carry out. And I suppose it's the bane of our lives at the moment. So can you get any advice on students uh, on how students could investigate hybridization in a practical sense in school? Maybe what plants we could use to make it speed up because we are stuck to the calendar year and doing things over a full 12 month cycle can't really work for us. Mm. Siobhan, on, on that side of things. <clears throat> yeah, it's difficult. Like you could probably, you know, maybe, maybe grow wheat inside and, and paint pollen, pollen onto the, the plant, like snip, snip the wheat and paint the pollen and put a bag over it. But like there's, yeah, like going on to simpler things, probably something that we didn't talk about earlier was um, germination and how seed gets, seed gets to market and things. So maybe mm -hmm. like a simple test would be to do a germination test. And it's something that farmers would do a lot as well on farm um, to test your seeds before they sow it. So just count out 100 seeds and plant them and See what your percentage is um but you're not you're not getting into the cross in there um but you maybe you could try the wheat um in the glass house scenario um it, it might work in it over a short period and just on that siobhan what trait might we follow on the wheat because we have to hybridize two varieties to determine the rate of transfer of a required trait um uh, probably uh, like resistance to septoria is going to be the most obvious thing because if you're in a glass house scenario you can you'll see the disease on the plant and it's probably going to be the easiest thing to to look out for but um how you'll see the differences i don't know might be difficult um yeah yeah it's and it's not it's not an easy task to do in in a short yeah. period of time <laughs> Oh, no, that's definitely the case. All right. I suppose we were looking for maybe a crop that would grow faster. Maybe would there be something in peas maybe that we could grow quickly and uh, look for their colour of petals or something? Yeah, maybe peas, peas would grow fast. I suppose anything when you're bringing it into the glasshouse um, scenario, like the 
the cereal crops or the grasses would would grow quick anyway in that scenario but yeah you could maybe maybe try the peas and and our beans even and the, the different color petals and see what they cross yeah yeah and i see one more coming in here now just one you can purchase maize uh, maize cobs to do a desk investigation on the kernel color to look at a three to one or nine three three one ratio and again would that be practical in our uh, school year um what, what are they doing sorry uh, maize, uh, maize the cobs and you can get uh i presume the kernels to look at the color the different colors in the uh, maize kernels yeah okay yeah so they're, they're yeah presumably they're getting maize cobs then on on farm or whatever yeah maybe yeah i'm not i'm not sure to be honest but yeah it probably could be grown yeah once again in the in the glass house scenario okay good good right so or what else have we got here? Uh, what practices maybe would Adam suggest that a farmer can put in place to help increase the level of AI use in the suckler herd compared to the dairy herd? Yeah, that's that's a good one, Joe. Um, I guess uh, with some farmers doing it, and that's would we'll say splitting up the cow and the calf. So so maybe allowing the cow and the calf suck just twice a day. Um, that breaking up of that bond uh, brings the cows um, into heat a little bit quicker. Um, and also a little bit of infrastructure maybe out in, in fields and that you know it may be a simple electric fence going out on one strand out from a gap uh, to leave it easier maybe to get cows and, and, and calves maybe in for AI a couple of simple steps like that and you know it's it's the thought of it more than the actual doing of it uh, any farmer that has changed to AI that they're relatively happy with the system um, and, and, and they can make it work yeah great stuff um, any advice from uh, from the panel on practical experiential learning that our students or for our students in terms of animal and plant genetics? Something I, when I, I seen that question coming in and, and something that, look, it's, it's only a visual, but uh, fertility tests and bulls, and I don't know whether you can get out to farms or be to do that, but it's also it's, it's it's always amazing to see that whole process just follow it through and actually get a look down into the microscope to see that sperm moving in waves. You know, it's really really interesting, and it's, I suppose it's part of genetics, uh, a piece of that. But I'm not too sure uh, as regards the logistics of getting out to farms, but it's it's definitely one that's always interesting when 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 you're fertility, fertility tests and bulls. Okay. Um, I'm just thinking of I'm just thinking of one on the grass side of things. Like I mean, you you potentially you know we have tetraploids and diploid grasses, and potentially a lot of farmers will say would sow a field of just tetraploids and and uh, another paddock beside it of just diplo of a diploid variety. And so I mean, in terms of students monitoring, kind of I suppose the the growth of the diploid versus the tetraploid, and I suppose the characteristics of the tetraploid, which is a more obviously upright, uh, you know, leaf size of grass, etc., and that kind of thing compared to the that I mean, that would be a very visible piece and a kind of a piece that you would kind of measure in terms of the yield and kind of, you know, grazing, etc., and that kind of thing, you know. So, um, yeah, great. Thanks, yeah, and even, even getting out Something if you like were that, able Aiden, on, on the grass side. Yeah, sorry, Siobhan, yeah. Sorry, Jack, you're coming in and out there. Um, no, just even if you're able to get to different varieties of wheat, let's say, and you can you can see the different types of disease or barley or wherever it may be. If you go out into a field now, you'll see the difference, different diseases between the crops. Yeah. And there's another one here for you, Siobhan. Uh, what traits in grass would be suitable to study when determining the rate of transfer of food? Oh, Jesus. Um, well, sure. Um, when you're <laughs> I'm, I'm stuck here now. Jack might help me on this. Um, um, I, I mean, I, there's one uh, rust prevalence, uh, Siobhan. Yeah. Again, it's it's very or mildew, it's a very maybe. mildew or rust. Like I mean, yeah. it's a very visible one, and you have some varieties that are particularly prone to rust. You know, I mean, it it blows in from Cornwall. We'll say onto the varieties in the grass varieties in Wexford. You know, I mean, I mean something something like that would be kind of very visible, and I call it. It wouldn't take a whole lot of, of, of biochem. Uh, technology to, to to try and kind of differentiate between one variety that's more prone to rust and so the, i mean rust is effectively that yellow covering on the grass leaf we'll say that you'd see at certain times of the year depending on the weather depending on which way the wind is blowing etc that kind of thing so um something like that siobhan might be might be might be suitable for the likes of that yeah great yeah. thanks and um is progeny testing used on potato farms Pro no Progeny testing on on progeny testing on, on, on potato farms. Is that huge? Are they are they I, I, I'm not I'm not sure that it is to be honest. You know, it's um <clears throat> no no it's not, but we do no. we we genotype in Ireland. Like there's a there's a breeding program in Oak Park where they be genotyping and things. Yeah, we're not 
progeny test and go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so I think I think that's all, folks. Um, yeah. I just see a comment in there from Lorraine on the on the genetics experiment, and she talks about the the you know the brassica crops, like so kale or rape or etc. That kind of thing, which are kind of maybe sown in in June or July, um, and they could be followed through until until kind of I suppose harvest in and they could start harvesting them in September or October, whenever the animals start eating them or whether you start. So yeah, they they they'd be another crop definitely that you could that are maybe more short cycle with uh, rather than the annual piece. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Jack, before, sorry, Joe, before you finish up, uh, Tuesday evening, we have anybody that's interested, actually, a full hour on breeding on Tullamore Farm um, in relation to how we use AI on Tullamore Farm, the bulls that we're using and some of the technology that we're using as well. It's a bit of a shameless plug there, but it's, it's half eight on Tuesday evening on farmersjournal.ie. Perfect. Yeah, that's no problem, eh? Adam. We're more than happy to, to, to join in for any of these. Okay, so it's a learning curve for us as well, and to keep abreast of the what's happening in agriculture at the moment because it's changing so fast. Um, so look, I just want to thank on behalf, I asked to thank Jack, Adam, Siobhan, and I think Aidan has gone there uh, for a brilliant presentation this morning, very, very relevant to our learning outcomes. Um, just to announce as well that uh, we are going to hopefully run a series of such um, webinars and panel discussions with Jack and his gang over the next while, and the Farmer Journal are very, very happy to do with us. Um, and we might be doing one in late April or sometime, Jack, I think. Perfect. Yeah, I think that's in the, in the schedule. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Joe. No problem. Yeah, that's brilliant. So thanks a million for all that. Um, and the last job you have before you go, Jack, can you pick another number between 1 and 239, except for 150? Uh, 101. 101. <laughs> Humphrey? Yeah. 101 is Sinead Thornton. Very good. Congratulations. Christy, see if she's here. She is. Excellent. Well done, Sinead. <laughs> well done, Sinead. I'll, I'll get in contact now uh, and let you know. Great. That's great stuff. Okay. So thanks very much again, Jack. Um, we'll, and Siobhan's still there. So you're more than welcome to stay on for the rest of the thing. And just like to now maybe welcome Vincent English from Vernier to do a quick promo for his uh, company. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Hello. Yes, Vincent, off you go. Yep. How are you doing? Uh, I believe this is a question and answer session, is it? Um, well, you can tell us some of the maybe the, the, the different uh, equipment that you have that would be very, very relevant to us. I've seen some of them in your little video promo earlier. Oh, sure. OK, well, um, essentially what we have is that we have a range of um, wireless sensors um that can trap that can really directly connect to things like ipads uh, whether it's android whether it's ios uh, whether it's macbook whether it's pc uh even chromebooks and we have approximately about 90 um wireless direct um sensors at the moment that will allow you to go into the field um take data you don't have to take a, a data logger with you um, and you can just grab the data on whatever handheld smart device that you have to hand. The software we offer is free. Um, there are obviously a professional version you can get if you need it. Frankly, you don't need it. Um, we also have a agricultural science support book as well um, that goes through lots of experiments in ag science and gives you also a teacher section uh, and a student section. And also to back the whole thing up, as well, we have introduced a professional diploma in data login for science teachers, uh, and that will start in September. Um, you may have seen our local college that's formed in relation um, to education in Longford. In association with Vernier, it's called Longford International College on TV there recently. Um, it offers master's degrees, uh, all the way to doctoral degrees um, through a various accreditations across Europe and the UK offering and accrediting our degrees and diplomas. So we think that perhaps what, what's needed is an online course, an eight week online course to help teachers that may not be familiar with the latest technologies um, to back up what we have to offer in terms of our equipment. Uh, and that will be, as I say, launching in September 
and that will be a pathway to a master's degree in science education if they want that to. So um, essentially we have pH sensors, CO2 sensors, chlorine, iron specific, potassium, ammonium, we've got weather sensors, CO2 sensors, we've got uh, also a special type of pH sensor you can shove into soil and it's not going to get broken with the traditional wet bulb approaches. Um, we've got various wide range temperature sensors, sound, um, and pretty much everything you might need for environmental monitoring and for ag science. Okay. And can you guess, um, we'll say such thing as a nitrate sensor for detecting nitrates in the water, yeah. Vincent, or we do, ammonia we do, gas we do. in the atmosphere? Yeah, we do indeed. We have direct uh, ISC electro technologies. We have nitrate, ammonium, potassium, um, and other iron specific ones too. Uh, also ORP obviously and, and the usual pH stuff. Yes, we do, yeah. Okay, and I was just looking at before and EC meters, they detect different things in the water by the change of the, I suppose, the electrical conductivity of it. Can they detect the presence of individual um, uh, ions like nitrates? It can. Well, we have the special one for nitrate. We have ones which can do, we, we kind of recommend that you might use maybe turbidity sensor for that if you're, if you're looking for a particular matter that you're not too sure of what you're trying to try and identify with. But if you're looking for specific ions, then we recommend obviously the specific meter for that. Um, we can detect certain particulate matter and other ion compounds within the more generalized BNC sensors, but if you want to do something in terms of getting accurate measurements, we obviously recommend the specific sensor for that. Perfect, perfect. Okay, I think that's the, only the question that, um, yeah, is there a sensor for ammonia levels in the air? No, no, we don't have that. Um, I don't think we've ever been asked for that. Uh, ammonium levels in the air is more of the, I suppose, the area of industrial measurements, you know, uh, those sensors tend to be quite expensive to make. Um, and unless you're spending an awful lot on high end capacitive uh, sensors, you're really going to have an issue with any kind of measurements that can be halfway relied upon. So that tends to be the realms of the, the industrial markets that we don't tend to stray much into. Yeah. Um, is there a meter to read carbon dioxide levels in soil? Um, in soil, carbon dioxide, if you're measuring in a gas form, um, or if it's going to be in a compounded form, uh, then no. But if it's going to be in a gas form, our CO2 sensor can measure that. We don't have a physical sensor that's like a pH one that you can shove in and it'll do some kind of measurement through an osmotic type approach. I don't believe there exists a sensor on the market, industrial otherwise, that will do that. Uh, so in, indirectly, yes. Uh, perhaps your, your question might be more directly doing it. The answer then is no. Grant, perfect, perfect. Okay, I think that's all the questions coming in here for me anyway, Vincent. Um, so I think everything that you have can be found on www.vernier.com anyway and forward slash. Yeah, it's, it's, all, it's, all, section. Yeah, it's all there and we're going to produce a special bundle uh, for uh, ag science teachers that will also include the professional diploma course that we mentioned too in one big bundle. That's brilliant. Okay, so thanks very much, Vincent. Um, thanks for that presentation. And just one thing before I go, for, uh, folks, I forgot to say Sinead Thornton won the prize, but I didn't say what the prize was. The prize is a meat hamper sponsored by the Certified Irish, Irish Angus Producers Group. And they're also the same people who uh, sponsored the uh, Irish Angus Beef Schools competition as well. So thanks very much to Charles Smith and the uh, Irish Angus, Angus Producers Group. Now I'd like to hand over to Johnny Gleeson and he will introduce the next group. Now, hi everyone. Um, so our next group is going to be a discussion around the IIS for fifth years and the theme of that again as we already know is support and conservation of the environment through Irish ag practice so we'll outline maybe a few areas of topics with our guests and then maybe at the end we'll have a Q&A where teachers might look uh, for help on how they might gather data in certain areas so I'd like to welcome uh, Dr Philip Murphy, Dr Stephen Wheeler and Dr. Catherine Keane as well. And so we might just do a quick introduction on each of please. Um, I think you're still up there. I'm here, Johnny. Yeah. 
Thanks for having yeah. me. Um, do you want to give a bit quick background to yourself, Philip? Yeah, I'm with the local authorities waters program. Um, I'm one of 36 scientists working across the country. Um, we're like a relatively new section um, that works on catchment assessment uh, for improving water quality. Um, I'm based in the southeast region. I'm on a team of six and we spend a lot of time uh, carrying out kick samples to determine water quality in local area. We work with different agencies then to develop targeted advice um, so that water quality, water quality can be improved then. Uh, if you want me to go into more detail, I can. Yeah, I think we'll uh, we'll definitely touch base on some of them. Um, um, Catherine, do you want to maybe give a quick intro to yourself? Hello, thanks, Johnny. Um, my name is Catherine Keane. I'm Countryside Manager and Specialist with Chagask. So I'm involved on the um, biodiversity and the agri-environment schemes on the knowledge transfer side. So, um, yeah, so I work with advisors and trying to promote best practice in, in all the habitats on the farms. Very good, very good. And I'm not sure if Steam has joined us just yet. I know he was having some technical issues earlier I'm on. I'm in. I don't know if you hear me all right. Oh, we can hear you um, there now, Stephen, yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Stephen Whelan, although my name tag does say Stephen Walsh for some reason. Um, uh, but technical issues. The area that I'm, I'm a, a, a lecturer in animal sciences at IT Carlo. I've been asked to start my video, so I suppose I should uh, excuse the state of me and uh, the surrounding area. The yeah, so. I suppose the I'm program director for the sustainable farm management degree at IT Carlo, and my area of specialism is in animal science. Very good, very good. Um, so I think we might just kind of we might just start from the point of view if so. This I know some teachers mightn't have shared this idea with their fifth year students currently, but if we're talking about support and conservation of the environment through Irish practices. Would it be right in thinking like what what we're trying to conserve on farms that would be the soil, the air, and the water, and maybe to elaborate maybe on areas that farmers would be um, trying to conserve and biodiversity and biodiversity. Well, do you want to kick off with that? Uh, we'll kick off with biodiversity. Do you want maybe a quick what has been done at farm level to conserve biodiversity, and we'll try and work towards topics that students might be able to look at then. Yeah, and they're very integrated. I mean, soil and water obviously are very connected. Or sorry, yeah, biodiversity is totally connected to soil, to water, and um, climate change, and the you know the peatlands behind me there, the, the hedges, everything. So it, they're all interconnected. I suppose that's the first point. Um, but yeah, I think you've touched on them all. Um, so I'm not sure. Uh, sorry, I only jumped in there to to, to defend the biodiversity. <laughs> you, you just. Um, let it slip. But uh, do you want me to just run through a couple of the habitats on the farm, Johnny? Yeah, it might be a yeah. good place okay. to start. Okay, so the, yeah, so if you have students, I mean, I suppose we'll start off with the well, whether they're on a farm or not, or whether they have access to these habitats. I would break habitats down into three different types. The first one is the linear ones, um, which are incredibly important above and beyond their area because of their connectivity. You know, the birds and the bats, when they go out at night, they fly along the linear boundaries. So the linear ones we're talking about, the hedgerows, um, stone walls, water courses, grassy margins. So the field boundaries, um, yeah, which can include any of those, anything that's linear and obviously not farmed because they're kind of outside of the field. The second type then would be the non-farmed kind of area-based ones that we talk about. So they would be uh, woodlands, uh, scrub, maybe wild bird cover would be the one under the schemes that we actually grow it, ponds. So they're, again, they're they're not linear, but they're um, a non-farmed area on the farm. And again, they are extremely, all of those are extremely rich in biodiversity. And then the third one is the farmed areas, which is probably a little bit more more difficult maybe, um, but at least to acknowledge it because somebody might be doing an overall farm plan. So the farmed areas then would be the, um, like the crops, what's a habitat? I mean, a habitat is somewhere where there's flora and fauna. So even our ryegrass and our crops have biodiversity, but they wouldn't have as high a biodiversity as uh, a species rich grassland, uh, a grazed mountain uh, blanket bog, um, so, you know, so there's, there's biodiversity everywhere, but then it's a case of, you know, quantity and quality would be the two things, whatever habitat or habitats you're looking at. Uh, quantity is kind of mapping or estimating in some way. And then the quantity, quality, 
there's there's a lot of um work kind of gone on in this now the scorecards development developed for assessing a lot of these uh things or you can make up your own you know as to whether you count species of flora and fauna or whether you uh, whether in general we tend to more assess the quality of the habitat and if the quality of the habitat is right as they say build it and they will come um the the species the flora and fauna you know will be there or yeah yeah if so it's kind of the quality of the habitat and just i'll just throw out a few more just in case anyone wants to come back on them that you know it could be on some farm other very valid topics would be invasive alien species um noxious weeds is another group that kind of uh uh yeah and then a couple of other ones. Oh yeah, two other ones I didn't may not have fallen into there. Archaeological sites. I mean, I presume reading the title, supporting conservation of the environment, we are talking about natural and built um, heritage. So archaeological sites would have both traditional farm buildings. There's a scheme there for that. Um, but again, just they're probably slightly off centre. But you could have somebody very interested, and to me, they're very relevant. Um, and the other last one then on the kind of more general is the the campaign for responsible rodenticide use. We know that a lot of our owls have rodenticides in them, so it's a campaign for rodenticide root, root, um, use and this, you know, a recommended way of, of uh, putting down the bait boxes and assessing them and, uh, you know, which we're trying to promote isn't generally done would be kind of a lovely study. And uh, yeah, okay, so that's that's my start. Oh, it's very good. Um, I know you've touched on a few points that my students have brought up there various. I might um ask uh, Philip and Stephen um when it when you kind of first saw that title support and conservation of the environment through Irish ag practices um where were your minds led to or areas maybe? Do you want to go first, Philip, or shall I? I don't mind. Uh, I have a bit of a segue there from uh, far ahead there. And stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> The biodiversity stuff would be relevant to us as well because we talk about um, where a farm has a waterway running alongside it, uh, the margin, the riparian margins in that are an opportunity to prevent either nutrient losses or other kind of runoff from sediment to a waterway. And that provides a kind of a double benefit of biodiversity if our riparian margins are managed or our buffer distance are covered. Um, so the, the theme then of conservation kind of for me was it was either protection it kind of meant protection, but there's also a need there to restore some sites as well to a to a, a particular status that we need. Say. So in terms of conservation, we need to either improve the water quality in, on our, our rivers that are beside the farms, uh, or we need to protect them for their for their status if they're sufficient. Uh, conservation then also relates to water use on the farm. So whether it's from the mains or a, a private well, uh, are we efficient enough in using the, the water correctly, <clears throat> preventing leaks and that kind of stuff. And I know Board B is sustainability survey and smart farming do a lot around that as well. And then there's also rules on protecting um, a well that's on the farm in terms of setback distances for spreading fertilizer. So the conservation part of the team then would relate to how we do those measures, are we protecting those sources, those environmental sources that we need to. That's what it meant for me anyway. Very good. Um, Stephen, you got anything to add there or maybe? Okay, so I, I suppose I'm, I'm going to focus on maybe with the within the field um, side of things then to just add to it. And I suppose some of the areas that I was thinking about were around the management of um, arable or tillage lands, it, use of cover crops versus non-use of cover crops, what are they bringing into the biodiversity or how are they helping the environment? Uh, and within the grassland side of things, you know, how are we managing that grassland? Um, you know, there's there's quite a bit of work going on now about uh, multi-species swards and, and things like that. It, there's, it's probably not to the penetration required for um, the egg science group to, to get a decent hold on it, but certainly there would be enough um, cover crop areas uh, for them to look at and different variants on the type of cover crops um, maybe assessing what sort of effects those are having on soil structure, soil carbon content, the biodiversity within the soil um, from a from a species, animal species perspective, I suppose. Hmm, very good. Um, I think a good, what we might do now is um, I might encourage teachers to throw in topics they might have taught themselves and we might have a, a conversation around them in terms of how they collect data. I know from my own lads, throughout this, I asked them, 
they, they came up with areas they'd look at, but there was no way of actually collecting data. And that is key to this. And I'm trying to like home in on like, it's not the topic that's going to get you your master or leaving cert, it's how well you carry out your experiment, how you set it up. So Phil, I might come to you, because I know you, you worked with me last week on writing the study guide. Um, a number of students um, were talking about water courses and how they're like, well, we might fence off animals, not let into water courses or fertilizer. How would we go about actually get collecting data on such a project or such an IAS? Our, our students at the moment still are farm visits allowed or not, Johnny? Johnny? Um, well, it would um, it's probably not already. allowed a minute, but uh, there would be a few students that would have access to their own yeah. farm as well. Like, so we might just maybe focus on students that have, and maybe at the end we might have a conversation around like if we have students that are in the town, where could they look at? And I probably feel like they'll probably look more at the hedgerows and stuff that they might have access to a hedgerow. But just maybe for the students that have access to a water course around on the farm, um, yeah. how, what could they look at in the river, basically, maybe might be a better question. In fairness, you can get a lot of information online um, as well. There's a lot of chemistry av information available per river and per subsection of a river. So it's worth finding out if you're living on a farm what the local um, river water quality is. And there's several monitoring points along them that you can find out the status. Uh, the status ranges from high, good, moderate, poor or bad. So we want to try and get everything up to good for the moment. Um, if you're on site, then if you do have a water body, provided it's safe to enter, um, health and safety will be everything you know about getting into the river. But there's a lot of kick sampling that can be done with, which will provide a huge amount of information to, to kind of come up with an experiment. Uh, kick sampling then is just looking at the invertebrates in the river and they're an indicator of the, the health of that river. And they're a kind of a long-term indicator as opposed to just a, a once-off sample. Uh, there's lots of information there. We're, we're part of a, a citizen science program as well that we're trying to get communities joined up. And they have, along with Simon Harris there, I think he's in UCC, he has an entire guide on how to carry out that kick sample to identify different invertebrates, which will give you a conclusion on the status. Um, so with that information, you can either carry out the kick sample at loads of different sites or in different times of the year or above um, specific areas, be it a cattle access, like you mentioned, or a crossing point for machinery. You can do a sample up, uh, upstream and downstream and compare those differences. Uh, it's all quite doable, like the information is there. Um, if it, it is great if you do have a water course on your farm, you can really test those things and confirm what's out there. Um, after that then, Johnny, if you're not on farm, it's, there's a lot of chemistry results available on catchments.ie, uh, the data section on that, and that can give you, provided you have a fair, you can get your the name of your local river. It won't be the colloquial name, it'll be a kind of a technical name. I know our river here locally is the River Tar, and it's called the Tar 10, Tar 010, and that's the only way you can find that on it by typing in that specifically. But there's actually a tutorial available for that as well. Um, I can hand that to you later on if you want. And there's a few other guides that we can use for getting that information on the ground, if you'd like. Yeah, you might even throw, um, I think there's a question coming there. What was the name of the website for getting data on rivers there? So uh, you might um, answer that one there. Phil, Catch, um, catchments.ie is your best bet, yeah. Catchments.ie is the best bet, very good. Um, yeah, I know like there's some students, um, there's probably no way, and I know students are on the way fertilizer towards rivers. There is no little kit they can get to actually carry out the experiment themselves, is there? Or is there anything we could set up? There probably is kits available, I suppose. Yeah, I think that there'd probably be Irish kits that you could get. You could probably pay something expensive for ones that are abroad. I think there's kind of paper tests or litmus tests for that stuff. Um, you'd be, you'd be, to be honest, you'd be better off with that data that you can get online, um, the chemistry results. Uh, it's easy enough to send out a quick uh, survey to a farmer as well. Uh, for their fertilizer use, their timing and that kind of stuff. A lot of farmers either have it in their head or they've carried out a, a survey recently with, I know here we've done the board BIA one, so the numbers might be in their head already. Mm -hmm. um, so a quick survey with a farmer if you're not on site to get that information on timing and fertilizer use and the amount, uh, would find that out. After that, testing on the water, there's a lot of chem data available. It's just to know how to get to it. And after that, you can, you can do a lot with making up, uh, I suppose, experiments with the information. Just on that, Johnny, and like mm. you can get, you can certainly get dipstick tests for a lot of the water quality parameters that are kind of, you know, quick, rough and ready as, as exactly as the level of accuracy. I don't know whether, like say what Philip's talking about, an upstream, downstream, whether those um, dipstick tests would be good enough to, to detect that. I don't think so. Um, there, 
there's a couple of good guides there produced by um, a group called Opal, O-P-A-L. Um, they have a number of field guides there that are um, basically for UK education, but I, I could be shot down by either Philip or Catherine, but um, species-wise, probably not terribly different from, from England to Ireland or from UK to, to Ireland. So I think the guides would be useful in terms of um, identifying, say, water beetles versus uh, freshwater shrimp versus um, some of the caddis flies, mayflies, things like that. And I can get down to the individual species level, but at least group by group by group. Um, and if you have an idea of the richness of the of the good fellows versus the bad fellows, then um, you're onto something reasonably good. I suppose one of the questions that I'd have is um, like, what is what sort of scope are we hoping for with these uh, um, experiments? And do they have to be experiments, or can you do a survey? You know, um, there's just just as much validity in in asking or obtaining people's opinion about certain things um, as there is in actually going out and measuring uh, a, my, my method A versus method B or whatever it might be. You know, nitrates and phosphates. Mm. Um, um, I'm best of my knowledge now. We are we are stuck to that the students have to deliver their own data, and they can. But is a survey? In. Does a survey count no. as data? I'm, no. I'm, I'm, I'm going, I'm pretty sure there now, I think someone else, Joe might be in the background there, he might back me up or someone else and I asked her that, surveys are not um, allowed count, I know there's been some, some remarks for this year's, um, sixth year's alright which is different but this one's just for fifth year's next year I know surveys are definitely not allowed to the best of my knowledge so they're stuck trying to get their own data which is kind of the issue where we're having with these how do we get the data? How do we get the project? How do we get them set up? So, um, yeah, it's difficult. I might just touch on one thing you said around, Stephen, about the, maybe the cover crop or the wild bird covers. Um, how would you think a student could go about setting up such a, an IS on that topic? Yeah. Well, this is it. You did need some idea of farm history. And chances are, um, lads that are in, in the last couple of tranches of glass will be, the tillage farmers that are in glass will be doing some sort of cover crops um, now, whether, again, I'm not 100% sure whether you can assess, say, between, you know, if we just go for all uh, brassica type covers versus a cover with black oats and vetch or black oats and crimson clover or something like that, uh, what sort of effect that has below the ground structure? I'm not sure. Obviously, the, the legumes are bringing nitrogen there into the, into the scenario. Um, is there, are there measurements around that? You know, or then do you, could you compare, say, uh, fields that have had over the last number of years uh, had cover crops established on them versus fields that haven't? You know, and there's a very good question there around carbon content of that soil, or even the the structural quality of that soil. I'm a little bit outside my own comfort zone here, but yeah. these are just um, yeah. say. Because we're we're doing the cover crop thing at home, but there are a number of farmers in in my area that that don't do cover crops, where it's just bare to um, bare stubble over the winter. Uh, and in the southeast, you'd have um, plenty of examples of that it, within the same locality, not the same farm, but same locality. Yeah, yeah. compare them there, yeah. And then um, I just think I just I was driving along last week. It was a heavy rain, and I just kind of I saw like just water gushing onto the road and soil coming off into the drains in the road. I'm just wondering. Would there be an IS around that? Like students could look at that, maybe some sort of soil structure um, conserving the soil. Um, I just a thought I had when I was driving along. It's an incidental thing when it happens, and it's it, it's normally not um, significant as we'd say for an impact because it might only happen once or twice in a year. Okay. Uh, the practice related to that would be your hedgerow management or your field management to prevent that runoff and the timing of ploughing and that kind of stuff. Um, but if you wanted to look at sediment in a river, it's quite doable as well. Uh, again, if you're to take a cattle access, you could it, it kick in the bottom of the river. Um, there is a method for it. If you had a, a tile down, you can see how much of that tile is covered by the sediment after you kick it. And you could do that up and downstream of a site as well, just to determine uh, whether it's, it's a, a high level or not. Sediment can kind of block up the gills of those invertebrates in the, in the river and uh, choke them out as well. So okay. it's an important one, sediment as well. Uh, sometimes more so than nutrients, but um, 
you could relate that to a, a, a runoff from a road then as well if you wanted. Yeah, okay then, yeah. Oh, we might just touch base then on like what I think a lot of people might look for is our hedgerow with our ditches. And I know when we heard about conservation, I remember I had one student and he had, he had 100 acres and he wanted to get rid of every ditch and he does a strip wire there now and dairy cattle, he'd be happy for the rest of his life when he leaves school. And there's me trying to tell him about conservation. Um, and I was like, do you know ditches? He goes, no, no, we want to, I want to get rid of them. Like, so I was kind of trying to try to show the students the value of these areas that they mightn't see um, as much production. And so where could we go and how could we get an IS from a hedgerow? Um, how could we go about collecting data? I know one student of mine is on about fencing off the hedgerows at different intervals. So a meter away from the hedgerow, two meters away. And then they're going, they were, they're going to look at the hedgerow. But I was like, what data can we collect from that hedgerow? Or what can we do there? So, are you coming back to me? Yeah. Um, yeah. Just, just, just on the collect, in more general on the collection of the data there. Um, what the lads were saying, it is not easy. I mean, I'm an, I'm an ag, and I wouldn't know all the different species. It's, it's not, it's not an easy one. Um, if you are going down to a species, while, but there may be very simple ones there. Just two examples. Um. Uh, that I've I've heard about was you know and we when we are talking about biodiversity we're also talking about soil biodiversity and you know literally counting the, the earthworms is in a block of soil so that's doable you know you don't need to know which earthworm it is I assume or whatever or you may or may not um, bee counts I think there's a simple one about um, I think it's on even on the pollinators.ie website about if you sit for 20 minutes looking at a set area for a set time, et cetera, et cetera, and you literally count the amount of bees on a sunny day or whatever appears or invertebrates. So there may be simple ones that I'm not familiar about for specific flora and fauna. Um, I suppose counting flowers uh, and the timing as well is very important, both in a hedge or in a species rich uh, grassland field. You know, you could assess a field, either a square or a walk through it, on what flowers are there each month, because obviously the bees need to be fed all year round. So that could be particularly important with the hedges, um, but also the grass fields or the margins there. The one you talked about a minute ago is really a margin uh, assessment of what's in that grassy area. That's really good. So what comes up? How does it compare to the middle of the field when you do fence off a grassy margin? even the quantity of flowers without getting into, now again, the, the honor student, I presume will go and look up the flowers and, and get to grips with them better than I would even know. But you know, so there's, there's endless there, but even just quantity and structural quality of that uh, fenced off a uh, grassy, mar any fenced off area will develop even within a year, a completely different structure to the middle of the field that's grazed and cut. So it will have clumps of, of grasses where the spiders overwinter, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, but rather than counting the species, if you can assess the habitat and there's, you know, definitely hedgerow surveys there. And maybe if you do different things to the hedge. Um, mm. The other thing, just coming back to that, maybe, and it may even help the person that's, that doesn't have a farm, but even if they do have a farm, would there be any, wouldn't, wouldn't it work if you had, um, window boxes. I mean, I do this for demos all the time. And so either two hedges, I could prune one back, I could leave one and you could, you know, quantify what happens with the cover crops and um, the wild bird cover. I think that's the, in the, the pearl mussel away from the cover crops are to do with the tillage. Uh, otherwise, I think somebody mixed up there. The other crops are the, the wild bird cover or the crops for wildlife. But again, could you grow them in a in window boxes in a very or on your farm if you have a farm different types and at least because i think i think from my limited experience with a few students what you what you really want them to do is go x number of times and count something and write up that isn't that i think and um, what i got gleaned from it from my in, in, in so you know they need to count something, measure something every time they go and then can report on that. So it could be growth measurements of, you know, different species of hedging, different species of grass or wild bird cover crops or whatever, be it mm. in a field, be it in a, so yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I think, I think I think that is one thing maybe for the, the, the students in the town or a lot of schools now have a school garden, so maybe planting some wild bird cover or a window box of hedging could be something to look at. Um, I'm just going to run through a few of the 
question there and the question answer that maybe if you if you you'd all should have access yourselves and you could answer maybe a few of them. But um, I just see here um any suggestions of an experiment that could be done to give results on the biodiversity, not a survey. So we're saying there we can we we'll just measure how the flora and flora is growing. Uh, Lorraine asked, hi, for students looking at biodiversity, can you recommend resources where they can find keys for plant identification if comparing hedgerows to a fence? So is there anywhere we could get them keys to know what we have? Um, this hedgerow said, okay, this is kind of assessment cards in, in all the projects, the Hen Harrier and the Pearl Muscle Project have assessment cards, um, the Boron, project burn program has assessment cards um i'm trying to think now uh the the chagas uh, oh, uh, book you know uh sorry the, the chagas book that the students use the level five uh, book has a hedgerow assessment at the back you know you're going out quantifying height width whether there's a bank whether there's a drain etc cetera, etc cetera, and you come up with a score for the edge so very simple very practical more so than going into the species you count the number of trees that are left growing up in the hedge so the the chagas i'm not sure if you have access to that uh, johnny but i'm sure somebody could uh, could get I, I could you know provide it to um what else were you asking the, there the yeah habitat, the, the guide to habitats yeah. you know foster is it um something the, foster the is ireland's guide, guide to habitats to yeah that's a that yeah. lists the species and the habitat type and um, a habitat survey of a farm could go a long way as well uh, in terms of just but again we're are we, you know that's that would be in terms of getting familiar to species anyway um yeah. and it's a it's a good guide at least for uh, getting that kind of baseline if you wanted to yeah good um kira asks, is, the, is it the winkler method an effective way of gathering data on water quality for students or is there another method method used winkler method yeah, W I N K L E R. Or I'm, I'm I haven't it. heard it. Heard of it? Is it a is it a version of the kick sample? I wonder. Um, what Here I would say right. about the kick sample is there is a lot of good in Irish information available on it. Um, like I said, Simon Harris has an old video on the. Um, oh, someone just said there's a test for BOD. Some of the yeah, some of the other parameters. If you're not looking at invertebrates, then are the temperature, biological oxygen demand, but you'll need probes for those. Those can be borrowed if you could probably ask maybe somebody in my organization um, or maybe the advisors, local advisors could help out too. Um, Very good. Um, dissolved oxygen. Yeah, you can do it um, with probes anyway. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, this might be one for you. Uh, Philip Ryan asking students thinking of investigating the reduction in the use of antibiotics, et cetera, for animal health issues. Does this fall under conservation? And if so, conservation, what exactly? What do you think on the topic? Yeah, after, so the use of antibiotics. Yeah, the students it, thinking of yeah, students thinking of investigating a reduction in use of antibiotics, etc., for animal health issues. Does this fall under okay. conservation? Well, yeah, it does because I mean, if you consider that we all animals, including ourselves, use common antibiotics, so there, there is an environmental. If you consider us to be in the wider environment, yeah, there is a there is an impact there. There's the issue of antimicrobial resistance and things like that. Tough I wonder, one to measure, they, though. Are they thinking antimentics, um, Stephen? Antimentics would be better because at least you could go out and do a faecal sample and an egg count on it or you know if you if they knew someone in a regional veterinary lab that they could get a faecal egg count done on it um just seeing even looking at resistance say on a farm to various well no you can't do that because you'd have to go out and test no if that, that well, forget that one because you need term, yeah. but i mean they, they, yeah well also you need a license to do it so i think but less you know, with them. would help biodiversity that's i suppose you know if there was something there because you're you're saving the rest good bones. <laughs> there's a lot of work on ivermectin use and the effect on mm -hmm. on uh, other species outside, like John Finn's work down in in um, Johnstone Castle there. Um, probably, po possibly, Jai, but you need to tease yeah. that one out really carefully. I think once you go into the animal side of things, there's a, there are real questions over the ethics and uh, you know has basically it has to. Uh, be considered normal commercial practice okay, right? yeah. if it, anything beyond that and like we wouldn't get that kind of experimentation for undergraduates even you'd struggle yeah. to get it for postgraduates so um, yeah another, sorry yeah another one here just on um uh, i'm aware there's a lot of questions come in so we might ask you guys just to hang on after the call and answer a few of them but a, a student of mine is determined looking at comparing irish native sheep breeds 
uh, versus breeds normally used in sheep production. But again, I don't know what that he could collect that is irrelevant. Is there anything worthwhile he could do with that? Um, I kind of so uh, Irish breeds of sheep versus uh, the commercial breeds. But um, my first thought there, we only have one native breed of sheep, and that'd be the Galway yo, wouldn't it? Yeah. So, um, there's your first stumbling block, I'd say. What in the case yeah, right. looking for is it economic that they want to under that they want to compare? You'd have to it would possibly be better looking at uh at more prolific breeds versus the versus conventional, like the Belle Claire is an example of a synthetic breed. Mm-hmm. Um that's that uh, and its prevalence or use on, on Irish sheep farms. The sample size there is getting fairly small and you talk about sheep farms already. Yeah. <laughs> But I suppose the link there would be the the, the genetic uh, biodiversity. The, the if if there was something you could look at, it, it would it could it would be justified because um the the rare breeds are conserving mm. genetic biodiversity. But so I suppose could you compare, as you said, anything to do with the Galway compared to um other sheep? Yeah. And perhaps the breed society is the is the route to go down there. Like, I'm 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 not again. I'm not sure whether there is a Galway sheep society or, or association, but there may well be. And same on the beef side of things. Like you see, on certainly on social media now, there there is a bit of um, noise around the I say noise, but the the mild uh, and a few other Irish uh, breeds of yeah, cattle. The, the beef, you know, the, and the that is protective more... and genetic biodiversity. Yeah, yeah. The cattle and breed, breed associations are the people to go there. Yeah, very yeah. good. Um, I have another one here, Amanda. A lot of my students are in the, are from the town with no access to farms. They are hoping to investigate organic versus inorganic fertilizers. The link to conservation the environment would be reducing the greenhouse gas and involved in the production and transport of fertilizers. Uh, what does the fa- panel feel about th- this one? Is it viable? So looking at your inorganic and organic fertilizers in terms of maybe where they're coming from and their the Chagas um, Farm Survey, I think, is every year. Uh, it's a good resource for comparing enterprises. Uh, I'd say at this stage, they do have greenhouse gases and that kind of information. Uh, it's mostly an economic one, but they have a good few other indicators, um, the Chagas Farm Survey. For that Even from a doing experiment, that's a that's a very nice um, greenhouse or flower pot experiment if they had access to um, slurry versus chemical fertilizers. How, how did it measure the gases? Emissions from it, not 100%, but it could certainly measure response rate from the plants, say, for example. I assume if it's taken up, then it's not going somewhere else. If it's taken up into the plant tissue. Yeah, okay, very good. Um, I'm just going to put out a few more, maybe. Um, oh, yeah, at this point of view, any examples of an equine study? Um, and that'd be something I have two students that being into horses. Is there is there any topic we could look I know now, maybe no one here is an expert in equine. Um, is there anywhere we could look in terms of equine? It's probably to do with their grazing and what they're grazing. Would it be more? And I'm not really sure myself. Yeah, if you're looking at something measurable, it would probably yield, but you'd want to compare it to a non equine farm, say, you know, if you wanted to get enough data, maybe. Yeah. Yield, or, or even if you look at earthworm count, it's different manure and different diet. Yeah. Um, in a cow versus a, an equine <clears throat> horse. If yeah, you had mixed yeah. cattle and, and equine grazing, that I maybe up in your neck of the woods, Johnny, it's all horses versus uh, and sheep. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, yeah a couple of a couple of spades and dig under a, a, a few cow pats versus the equine uh, dung pats might give you differences in in artwork numbers or something like that. Or grass species too. Uh, or gra- yeah, grass species uses yeah. Yeah, um, I just have a look here now. Um, uh, one student wants to investigate water quality in the river where cattle use as a drinking point versus the river that's fenced off. Can he test plant biodiversity around the waterways and possibly the soil compaction experiment and soil compaction and infiltration? Would a student be able to identify water species on their own using a kick sample? Um, I think like, we've talked about a kick sample before, Phil, just in a few phone calls. It is a quite easy method of an experiment to carry out yeah. and would be something a student could do. The main thing would be getting a net, Johnny, to borrow a net from someone. Uh, If not, though, you can, like, to a very limited extent, you could uh, kick and collect with some kind of a bucket uh, underneath, but it'll take a while to filter it out and that kind of stuff. But uh, a net would be the best thing. It's it's literally something that's designed now for citizen science, so it's supposed to be for anyone can do it. Uh, And that means that the survey 
um, is kind of designed to, as Stephen said, divide the guys into good guys and bad guys in terms of those invertebrates and make it as plain as that. So an interpretation can be made. So if it's available for citizen science, you know, it's quite doable by from a student's perspective, I would think. Oh, very good. And, and just to kick just sample, to to repeat, back up, Philip. Yeah, yeah. Um, those kick sample nets aren't expensive. Like. Uh, if the school was willing to, I think they're fifty or sixty quid uh, from memory, from uh, True, yeah. um, from Linux education or some of the, no, no, not, but, but I can't. We bought two of them anyway this year for the college, and they were cheap enough uh, as they go. Like you know, you you wouldn't be long spending that on reagents <laughs> even in in the oh. particular experiment. Could be shared between students as well. Yeah, very good. Um. Look, there's a lot of a lot of questions that are coming in there, guys. So I would appreciate if you might give a little read in the Q and A, and maybe just fill in a few answers there. Um, I might get a Philip. Might just get you to pick a number there again between um one to two hundred thirty nine. We have another um Angus hamper to give away to someone, so you can't pick one fifty. You can't pick one hundred one. Can I pick one one seven? Yeah, one one seven. Yeah, come free. Are you there? Uh, 117 is Michael Carey. I'll just see if he's here. He is. Well done, Michael. Good job, Michael. Very good. Um, no, God, I really appreciate you coming on the call and um, offering um, your views and all this. I know um, there's probably no one expert to go to on this IES, and it's probably going to be the, the, for the years to come. There's going to be not going to be one answer to everything. But um, I uh, just on behalf I asked in the teacher on the call, I'd like to thank you. And if you could, if you wouldn't mind answering a few of them questions in the chat, that would be great. And um, thanks very much. And I think that kind of wraps up everything for the, for in terms of speakers. I know we have our AGM next. I think Joe, do you want to come back on there now? And um... um, and just Johnny, just one last yeah. thing before we go. The signpost series on Chagas covers the, all the environmental. There's a video. From each week it's on every friday morning but the, the videos so every topic has kind of the a video on it at this stage there's a year's Perfect. worth of videos uh, so good to know thanks. good to know thank you bye thank you yeah so thanks very much for that johnny and all the panel that was absolutely fantastic great ideas never has come up there so i think um we have edco now i think carol is there to do a little presentation for edco yeah, I'm here, Joe. Go ahead, Carol. Okay, I'll bully on on for a couple of minutes. Thanks for having us here today. Um, just a little bit about breaking ground. I uh, was supposed to put up a presentation there, but it's telling me that uh, I can't share it. Maybe Humphrey might be able to change the setting for me. I'll have it up. I'll have it up in one second for you. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Okay. That should be up there for you now, um, Carol. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thanks very much. So um, I know a lot of you are using the book already. Um, and I guess thanks very much for supporting us. Um, so the book itself, um, everything that you need to cover the course and um, the IIS um, is in the book. Um, we've covered every learning uh, every learning outcome in the specification. Um, all the specified practical activities are dealt with and they're laid out in the relevant units. We put in, in, an, in anticipation of the, the new exam, um, a wide number of media articles from a variety of different sources with students uh, able to answer the questions on them. And as you've probably seen with the sample paper, that, uh, that has actually come to pass. So hopefully those will be useful in class for students uh, being able to prepare for their exam. Um, all of the various definitions and keywords are highlighted and defined, and they're still being asked to do that in the, the new course. And we've put in a number of links to the relevant websites, uh, particularly the HSA one, where they have the online safety courses and uh, a variety of different Department of Agriculture links, um, which can be used in class just to integrate what's out there with what's in the book as well. I move this on here. Don't seem to have access. Sorry now. Right. So um, each of the learning outcomes in the specification is tied to each chapter. So teachers can reference back to the specification and then find out 
uh, what ones they're dealing with. All of the outcomes we decided initially to put uh, from strand one, which mainly deals with health and safety and scientific method, we put them into the first unit in the book, so it's easy to find them. But also, we don't all we don't expect teachers just to use the book and learn and teach the entire first unit as a standalone. Uh, myself, I use it more like a reference. So when I'm dealing with a particular aspect of the soil or the crops or the livestock section of the course, that um, I reference back then to a section from unit one, whether it be health and safety or some of the scientific method, how to write a hypothesis for one of the specified practical activities or um, looking at data, what's qualitative and quantitative data. And again, uh, if anyone's been looking at the uh, SEC sample paper, they'll see questions like that have been asked. Um, of course, uh, it was just being talked about in great detail there, the IIS, and it raises more questions than answers, I think. Um, hopefully, students will be able to incorporate some of that qualitative and quantitative analysis into their project. So I can just move on to the final slide there. Um, so the practical activities that the students have been asked to do, uh, the 20-odd the spec specified practical activities, each of them, when we designed them, we asked students to come up with a hypothesis and an analysis of their data and look at it, whether it was qualitative or quantitative. So the idea would be that they get into that frame of mind rather than the, the older style of a method resulting in conclusion to allow them to start looking at investigations in this manner, which is what they're being asked to do for their IIS and how to formulate the hypothesis and analyze their data as explained in the first unit of the book. And the other thing that is obviously being examined, but as part of the specification, is that there's eight cross-cutting themes. And we incorporated them across the book rather than students learning a topic and not seeing where it links into other areas of agriculture or indeed the course itself. So we hope people are happy with this. And um, thanks for supporting us by buying the book. And if there's anyone that wants to ask any questions about any aspect of it, they can. Um, I suppose the last thing I'd like to mention there is the online resources. So the ebook is available on, on edcolearning.ie. We have solutions to all the questions in the textbook up there. There's videos on a wide range of topics throughout the book um, with a huge focus on the crops and livestock section. Um, we have video animations for some of the other parts of the course, particularly with the cycles like the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, digestion. Um, we also have a longer list of web links on that uh, website um, for all different topics across the course. And for any students with special educational needs, if they are using the ebook, there's a, a read aloud facility which can help them um, as they're reading, particularly if that's their difficulty. So um, that's pretty much me done. Um, if anyone has questions. Okay, thanks for having us here today and um, the information on the IIS, the, the previous discussion that I was listening into before we started was really, really good. Uh, I hope everyone's getting on great with the um, IIS. I know it's causing a few of my students panic and some of them not so much panic because they've opted out. Yeah. Thanks very much, Carol. No problem. About it. Thanks for the comments yeah. there in the chat. Cheers, yeah, yeah. George, are you there? Okay, Ned. Am I on again, Ned? Aye. Yeah, off you go, George. Right, am I on screen? There's no, you have no camera on, George. No camera, you? sorry, one second, no, I'll just get, let's start to one second, no. One second, no. That's the thing. One second, I'll just get on screen. Yeah, we can see you now, George. Oh, yeah, great, all right. Right, uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, uh, our excellent speakers, unbelievable, great presentation, plenty to be it, and plenty more to follow. Um, it's my privilege now to thank, uh, it's probably left us, but uh, that's Dr. Owen Brennan for being honorary president for 2020, and to welcome 
Anne-Marie Butler, uh, our honorary president for 2021. Anne-Marie, as you got the details there, she's president of the ASCE and she is also, you know, it's the first time we've actually have the president of the ASCE and there's always been a great bond going back to Matthew Bart, I meant that at the start, it has continued right through the, through the years. We have a representative, thanks Johnny for working with you and thank you for working with Johnny. It's been a magnificent year and we'll give you a brief now, but we will have an, another day, hopefully in the field, when we've all got vaccinated and we can meet as a group and we have a dinner as well. So we'll give you the, an afternoon speech on that occasion, but just today, welcome, thanks for joining us and as our honorary president of ASTA for 2021. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Yeah, no bother, um, George, and thank you very much. It, it is an honor, I'm delighted to be here with you. Um, it's been a most interesting morning, a great panel of speakers um, and wonderful to hear the power of science, George. I suppose the focus of my ASA presidency has been the power of science and, and collective science voices. Um, from an ASA perspective, we represent over 1,700 members. All our members have a degree in agriculture or horticulture, fisheries, the environment or food science. So we have a wide array of voices within the ASA. We're delighted to have IASTA on our council. Johnny represents you very well and um, represent you very strongly. And I look forward to the year ahead where ASA can work well with IASTA. I think there's tremendous synergies there. Um, Siobhan Walsh, who was on earlier from the Farmers Journal is also on our ASA council. So it, it's, I think there's a, a great power here and a great vibrancy, George. And we certainly would like to help the, your members and the students. Um, the students are a bedrock for ASA. The vast majority of our members studied ag science at some part in their secondary school and then on to college. So I certainly would like to thank you for the honour. I look forward to working with you and congratulations to everyone today, George. And one, one, you were asked to pick a number between one, the number of numbers gone, one and is it 200 and, what's the number there, Humphrey? 269. 269. Okay. 239. 239, sorry. And okay, a spot sure. rise, I think, I think it's from Shaw's. Off, yeah. We'll go for a, an even 200. An even 200. And while Humphrey is sourcing the number there, I'd like to thank um, Elman Nolan there, who was the ASA rep along on the uh, new specification development group. And the ASA were, you know, tremendous there with us that time. They worked with us, they had a voice, they were, they were highly organised and all helped to put together you know, the framework of the new spec that we have today. And I mean, it's a true tale, but Anna our own, uh, Liam Kyle, who was our rep, and as well as that, we had Marie Hessian, and we had Seamus Hines, and Peter Keeney, and it was Michelle Morris uh, on that group as well, who were members of IASTA, and we thanked them for their work as well, but particularly the SAA, because the survey you did was uh, instrumental in getting the, the script for the new specifications correct. So I think, have we a winner there, Humphrey? We do indeed, George. Uh, well done to Fidelma Dalton in winning a 150 euro Shaw's voucher. And Fidelma is in, in logged in and listening. So well done, Fidelma. Congratulations again. Uh, thanks, Anne Marie. And we'll be talking again. So Very with much. that, um, we'll be having our AGM now in a moment. So are we all, Humphrey, you're in charge. And thanks to Humphrey while we're getting organized there because, you know, I, I fear that as I discovered, Myself last night on the in West Cork, we had an exec meeting. Uh, I couldn't log on because of no broadband, but we had no Grimdens today. So we uh, bought a bus there to Humphrey and Michael and anybody else that's involved in the high tech behind the scenes. We pulled it off, and uh, if people can stay with us for you know about a half an hour, we, 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 we stick to the schedule well and we, we have our AGM. 